I think you'll get rid of it. Uh, you'll get over it. The anointing's going to be even the same. You're not going to believe it. I have a jewelry on and a flight suit, and, it, and the anointing will still be on me. Isn't it? It's just amazing. Yeah, Holy Spirit is not offended by stuff like that. Okay, um, here's what the Lord instructed me when he visited me about Jacksonville and with you. And that's why I'm kind of disappointed that half the people still haven't come back yet. But we'll do it again tonight if we have to. But for you all, the Lord instructed me. I used to do this at the beginning of my ministry, and I wrote all my books based off of what I'm about to do. And the Lord asked me to do this again and do it here for you. So you might not see this again. And I don't need any more material to write books because we have enough to run us actually through about 2070. I mean, we have enough books now to, to last us for 30 or 40 years that are already in manuscript form. So what I need though is what's going on with you. And you don't have to put your name. I would like to know if you're a partner or if you're a student, um, but it's a three by five card. And this is what I did when I started the ministry. I have like a couple thousand of these in my office. I need you to write down um, something that you're, that you feel like I should address that you're dealing with. You don't have to give out any information. You don't have to be, it, you know, it's a three by five card for a reason. I, I, this, is not, this is not for your thesis. You know, this is, what I need to know is what are you dealing with and what would you like me to write on or address in, in future things? I have enough material to go on forever, but I know how it is. We need to keep in touch with each other. So this is the way I keep in touch with what's going on. I know, what, I know what's going on with me. I know what's going on with everybody around me as far as staff and everything because I talk to everybody, but I, I don't get to talk with you. So if you would write something out, something that maybe you feel like I should address um, and, uh, and just, I'm gonna pray over them all. But what I really need to know is what you're going through. And, you know, and, and so I'm looking for these key words like rejection and trauma and things like that. And you know, if you feel like, I mean, if you look at the, the hundreds, almost soon to be thousands of videos, um, I try to address all these different things, but However, I don't always get everything. And it may be that you just haven't seen one of these videos because it's not easy to sit for hours and hours and watch. And the videos will start getting smaller because um, I was asked by the Lord to do the first five years of three hour sessions. For the first five years, I had to do three hour sessions. So I do five, three hour sessions everywhere I go. And the reason why is that I'm sowing the word and that's what you need. You think you need the fire tunnel and the, and, and the hands laid on you and the prophecies. But I know, I know that that is not what helps you. What helps you is the word being sown in your heart. But what else helps you is what's not being taught as Jesus explained to me. And that's why I do last night. It seems like last night, all I was doing is picking out thorns and rocks from your soil in your heart. It would seem random, but I just let like the Holy Spirit without notes, and then this morning without notes, pull and tend to your heart. Because he said the soils that he said, was the, the, the word was sown, the seed, one only produced a crop. Only one soil out of the four produced a crop, and it was because of the issues with the soil. And so if I don't deal with what's going on in your heart, then I can't really help you have a crop. I can't see the word of God come forth if your soil's hard, or if you have rocks and thistles or thorns, um, if you're letting these things like the cares of life, for example, Jesus addressed. So I need, I need you to tell me what you're dealing with so I can deal with that because it's not really, three hour sessions don't really help unless I can get rid of, your, of what's in your soil that's wrong. The seed, the seed will not take. So out of the four soils, only one produced, and out of that, it wasn't all 100-fold return. There was 30, 60, and 100. I want 100-fold, and I want all the soils. I want, I want 100% return on, my, on the word, because that's what I get a reward for, not how much money you give me. You know, it's not money. I don't know where anybody got this. But the, the soils, is, it, that parable is talking about the soils. It's not talking about the sower. It's not the parable of the sower. It's the parable of the soils. And Jesus spent a lot of time on that. So please, would you take the cards that, they're gonna, that my staff's going to pass them out. And if you would, this is better than money to me. I, I need to help you, but I got to know what you're going through. Don't leave your name. Don't leave your address. Don't leave anything except if you're a student or partner, I just like to know. That's just for me personally. 
but you don't even have to do that. But I need to know, just write something down in privacy and then turn it in tonight. We're gonna, take, we're gonna collect them tonight. And then that, what I'll do is I'll go through each one of them, I'll pray over them. So you'll get prayer even though I don't know your name. But um, that way, going forward, the Lord said that out of this, it, it might change the direction of warrior notes in the next couple of years, maybe addressing certain things. For instance, um, for instance, I, I was in Dalton, Georgia, and we finally got the convention center. The first service we had in Dalton was my first year, and we had about 85 people. And um, now we have about 1,800. But I noticed that the kids uh, and some dogs and, were playing on blankets, and they were all over the, the convention center. And as I'd walk down the aisle, there'd be kids playing, and they'd, over here there'd be kids playing. And the Lord just spoke to me, why don't you do something for the kids? And he said, it's time to, to do the simulators. It's time to do all the, the things that you see now, to bring the kids involved with it. But what happened was, um, our staff was talking to some people, and one of the, later on in the year, maybe in a couple years later after we did this, the, uh, the, there were parents in the back, and the kids were up here doing the simulator thing, and um, they asked, well, you know, how did you find out about Warrior Notes? How do you know Kevin? He goes, I don't know Kevin. I don't know Warrior Notes. My kids wanted to fly the simulator, and they made me take them here. And they were sitting in the back, and they heard the gospel. And people were getting saved because the kids are bringing their parents. Okay, so that is how God's... God helps me. I, I see this and I see a need. And then the other thing was is that, um, you know, I eventually want to have food. But see, hotels get really, um, you know, they want, they want the money. So they don't want us bringing anything in, you know, and so there's all this stuff going on. And I thought, well, how can we do this? And so the Lord gave me a whole bunch of ideas about how to provide food, make it like a camp meeting type thing. So I wanted to give, give it, uh, you know, opportunity and so he, he, he said, he told me what to do. And so you'll be having that coming. You'll see that coming um, exactly how to fix all this. Okay. But there's some things that I, you know, I, I shouldn't have to use the gifts of spirit with everything. Sometimes it's just passing out a three by five card, you know. And um, so would you please just be honest? Don't let any, your neighbor have to see it or anything. I just need to know what's bothering you. Like what, what, I, what I need to take a hammer to the devil's head. Uh, I just need to know what, what he's what he's doing to people. And um, I can preach the gospel, I can, I can do that. But I like the sniper thing. I like to be able to nail specifically what, what it is. If you're dealing with rebellion, if you're dealing, um, you, know, you know, like for instance, if, you, if you're speeding all the time, I can fix that, just use, just use your, your speed control. Just, I set it on 35 through my neighborhood. Because if they pull you over 37, because it's a rich neighborhood, I, I, don't be mad. I, Kathy and I actually worked for a living before we went to the ministry. We have a nice house. We pay for it ourselves, just so you know. But you go through 35, you're fine. 37, bam, you're, 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 you're helping the police department in that area. 37, two miles over, they, they pull you over. So I just set the speed control you know, on my car. Never get a ticket. Isn't that amazing? So, but, but here's things that you can do if you talk to me and tell me what's going on. I can tell you, okay, here, we can do this, this, and this. This, you know, the last time I went to driving school was 22 years ago. And I haven't got a ticket since, and that's, that's God's favor. But the guy told me, just put, the, put, just put your uh, speed in, and you won't, you won't get caught anymore. Well, that's a pretty good idea. Yes, had to go to ticket school, but to find that out, but that's okay. But, you know, 22 years of good behavior. What I'm saying is, is that God's a practical God, too, as well. And there are solutions to things. And um, a, a lot of us think that it, you always got to be spiritual. You know, and you do have to be spiritual, live from your spirit. But there are other things that are practical. And, and that's what I want. I want to help people. So how can I help people? How can I help kids? You know, and what, what the Lord told me to do is create opportunities for people. Create opportunities so that they can grow. And I'm telling you, we just need to take out these rocks and these, these things in, in there. So um, please do this for me. I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm going to keep talking about this until I know that in my heart you're going to really do this. I need to help people. 
And sometimes, to be honest with you, I feel like God's favor is, is really on, on us, and I start to feel disconnected because God's favor is so strong. And so I, I automatically think that this is happening to everybody, and it's not. There's a disconnect. And so that's what's wrong with ministry, is ministry should be connection with people. You should never lose that, you know. And I think that's why Kathy and I, we discussed this. This is why God kept us. All my friends are actually retiring from ministry now, that from the, all the people that I went to school with. They're, they're done, and I'm just beginning. But I think he preserved us. He kept us for this certain time now. Right? Okay, and so all of us are together, and I, I really want to know what you're going through. And if I'm missing it in some area, if I'm not emphasizing certain things, I'm sorry. It's just that I don't know. I can't really honestly say I know what you're going through because I might not. I didn't, I mean, Kathy and I didn't have children, so I wouldn't have an, any idea what it's like to juggle you know, that kind of a lifestyle. I took care of people on an airplane. It was close. <laughs> it's crazy people on those airplanes. You know? <laughs> yeah, 100, 100 and some people that don't want to fly, you know. But anyway, I love you all, and I need you to communicate with me, and then I will steer the teachings and the writings toward these things. Because to tell you the truth, there's nothing new under the sun, and, and everyone is going through that similar things all over the earth. And, and, and uh, you need to know that, that this is, not, this is common, what's, what's going on. Everybody goes through that. Okay, uh, anything else I need to say? Okay. All right. Well, I'm actually going to teach how to study, guys. So. All right. Let's talk about, about on, uh, on uh, chapter one, which is on page three, Enoch pleasing God. And, and of course, I have to, I have to bring, I, I got corrected by God. I need to bring that correction to you. So there's a lot of things that we don't understand about faith. And um, I think that it's pretty clear that if we really had faith, we'd be seeing mountains move. And my, 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 my saying is this, I'll know when people are getting it when I wake up in the morning and a, and a mountain flies by my house. <laughs> then I know like people are getting it. It's kind of like the thing I say to say it because this is the thing is is that people like I was I was part a part of this. I was highly trained by by faith schools. Uh, I was under faith preachers. You know, highly trained in all of this. I had hands laid on me so many times that I got a bald spot on top of my head, but <laughs> it didn't it didn't increase my faith. And I listened to the Bible all the time. I quoted the Bible all the time. I, I'm just being honest with you. I did not see the increase in my faith that I thought I would get because they say faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's in the Bible. I understand that. But there are other sides of faith that are taught in the Bible that were neglected. And what, what happens is, is uh, my faith increased through suffering. <laughs> and that's not very popular. And that's not like a faith message. And so... You know, I didn't get a degree in suffering, but I, I do have a degree in suffering, but I thought it was a devil. And it is a devil, just like the devil's behind everything. I blame him for everything because he was the or, origin of all this. Okay, but there are some things that we need to mature in in order to, to not be hard on ourselves, and that is, is that when bad stuff happens, you have to be able to process it the right way because every one of us want to file it some way. And so we, we, have, we do the blame game. So it's good to blame the devil. But the devil's going to yell, I wasn't even in the area. That was you. You know, and even though he's a liar, he's actually telling the truth sometimes. You know? And we have to be honest with ourselves is, listen, you know, we're always like wanting to put the blame because we want to file it in order to deal with it emotionally. And um, Enoch wasn't like that. Enoch... He submitted to God, you know, when he, at 65 when he retired. He was 65. And then he walked with God 300 years. What was, was the real key? Well, I'm going to show you, especially you students, this is what I learned on the other side of everything. Because, you know, I went through the whole thing with my degrees. 
and I put them on the wall. I didn't feel any more spiritual, and I, I didn't have any more faith just by having the degrees. And then when I got my doctorate degree, I didn't feel like I was any smarter. I just knew how to study more, and the more that I studied, the more that I found I didn't know. And so it was really the reverse. When you get degrees, it actually makes you humble because, well, I mean, for, it should, but it's not something you brag on because what it does is, first of all, it shows you you're, you're qualified, um, you're, you're qualified in theology, but then when you're questioned about theology, you don't know everything. And so you have to tell people, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know when Jesus is coming back because I asked him and he said he doesn't know when he's coming back. So, you know, and he actually mentions that in the Bible. So it was like I wasted a question on, you know, I, I burnt one of my questions, you know. <laughs> so and anyway, anyway, there's certain things about God that, can, that you need to know. And one of the things when you study as a student, you don't have to wait until you get your degrees to, that you can get smart and build your faith by looking at the whole scripture in the context uh, and not just pulling scriptures out like the charismatic movement taught you to do. And, and, and some of these other uh, word of faith, things like that have pulled stuff out. And instead of like, you know, not everybody in the word of faith is wrong. I'm not saying that every pastor is wrong. I'm not saying that any of you are wrong. I'm not here to do that. What I'm here to, to say is, listen, we got to look at the whole word of God. And if something's in the Bible, you can't just like pretend it's not there. And, and I think that you're robbing yourself in the long run because you're being hard on yourself when stuff happens. You have to deal with things that you got to remember that Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And he wrote it from jail and he was a great man of faith, but he didn't have a 401k and he didn't have a jet and he didn't have a ministry like we have here. He didn't have a lot of, of uh, pu publishing, uh, publisher publishing his books, things like that. He had letters that he was writing to the churches and he wrote them from jail. But be honest, you wouldn't know he was in jail when he wrote them because they're so profound in, in faith. And so the, the key here is that he didn't write from his situation, he wrote, he wrote from his revelation. That's good. So when he was in jail, chained, and all the stuff that you could imagine and worse, he was writing from revelation so you wouldn't know that he was actually in jail. And at times he was sick but he wrote about Jesus being the healer and he wrote from that place of revelation that Jesus heals and that he's praying for everyone's healing. When he was asking people to give, he, he said, we're gonna come by and collect it and bring it to Jerusalem. He said, I don't need anything because I actually work for a living, you know, and I don't need anything. And that's my brag, he said. And so I'm glad that Kathy and I worked most of our life. And I, I'm glad to tell ministers, please work. And that goes over well. Because I wasn't even allowed to be ordained by Kenneth Hagin because I worked. I, had, I would have had to lie in order to get ordained by him. But and I told, I told his, them, that, you know, everyone that took over from that, I said, well, then even the Apostle Paul couldn't get ordained by Brother Hagin. So that kind of changed it. But I, I had, you know, I don't need that now anyway. I love everybody there but I don't need that. You know, I just ordained myself, <laughs> you know, with, with, through warrior notes, you know. My, my point is this, all of you think you might understand something about God, but it has to be the full counsel of God. In other words, each word in here is going to influence you and it would take a lifetime. Enoch had 300 years of walking with God before he disappeared. Um, most of us don't, even with the best vitamins, we don't have the ability to walk with God 300 years. This is my point, is most people, Adam had 930 years, and you talk about all of the sons of God that were alive and lived, and you look at the people, Moses, 120 years, and you, you start to notch it down 180 with Abraham, and you, know, you can keep on going down, down, down. These men learned how to walk with God, but it took many, many years. And you read about angel visitations and things like that, but if you look in the book of Acts, the angel visitations were sometimes 20 years apart. But it makes it look like they were having this stuff happen all the time. I'm only doing this because you're, you're being hard on yourself because you're not really being honest. But it, it's not your fault necessarily it's because you have to really investigate and look. The best thing you can do is read around scripture. So I would, I would think, I mean, I know you would, 
is that chapter 11 of Hebrews would be a good chapter to learn about faith. Because it mentions certain characteristics in there about certain people, and it goes through this whole line of people. However, some of these people actually refused to live and be delivered. They wanted to die for Christ to obtain a better resurrection. Well, I, I must have missed that day at the Word of Faith school because they didn't teach that. You know, you're going to live forever, or at least 120, and that's what God allots for you. But these people were persecuted, sawn in two, you know. I don't have a course on that. But think about it. People that believe just like you died and suffered terribly so that we have the freedom that we do today. And that's the honest to God truth. I, I stood right on the spot where, where Paul was beheaded in Rome. They said the blood is right down in that Roman road, right? His blood is down in those cracks. I was in the holding cell, the, 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 what they held him for before that happened. I was in his holding cell. I went down in it. And, he, and I, I thought about how he wrote to us and what we have and what he paid for that. And then his blood, he, he, was, he, he, was, he, he said, um, the Lord has revealed to me that I'm going to receive my crown. And he lost his head. You're not going to hear this in church. You're not going to hear this in, in most schools and things like that. But this is the thing, is that faith is beyond this life. It's beyond that. It's the reality of where, who we are and where we're going as well. And actually, we already are there in a way. It's just time and distance that, that is between us. Because eternity is now in our hearts, it's in our hearts. Okay, so when you read, and it mentions Enoch in chapter 11, and you, and you read that, it talks about faith, and it says that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, because he was known as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, see, this is, this is how you talk about faith, is when it's being mentioned, and it's mentioning people, and then the validity, validity of their life attaches to a doctrine which Hebrews is doing to each person. So the key to Enoch was not like going to Kenneth Hagin's school, which he couldn't do. And, and, and if it wasn't for Brother Hagin, I wouldn't be where I'm at. But so was Andrew Walmack and all these other people. They have all influenced me. But to tell you the truth, once you have been on the other side and you come back, which very few people are allowed to do, and given a second chance to do it right, which I was allowed to do, you know, then you can see from both sides of this, like you can see the discrepancies. And what I see lacking is the understanding that God's got you in his hand and in his heart, and he's never going to let go of you. You would have to fight him to get away. And that, that he has more interest in you than you have in yourself or anybody around you. Sooner you get to that, the faster you're going to grow. All right, so Enoch pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Which is inferring that pleasing God was part of his faith. Only because you got to read into what's being said, how the writer is thinking. He says, he says that Enoch pleased God, and, he, and then he, the thought in his mind as he's writing is, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So he's tying together the fact that Enoch pleased God, and it was connected to faith. All right? And then you students, you don't stop there. You keep reading because then it says, because it's impossible to please God without faith because you have to believe that it exists, okay? Well, that's pretty easy for most people. But this is the big one, and this is the key to Enoch, and that's why I wrote this study guide for this weekend, and I'm teaching it, is on that very verse, is that it says that it, 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 it literally... It literally says that you have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
which is a mathematical formula. I have to say it this way so that you can get it. It's, to, it's saying, okay, faith is equal to these two things. You have to believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Because he's saying this in the same line of thinking. So the author, which was Paul, he hid himself. Paul wrote Hebrews, even though people don't know that. He hid himself because he was speaking to the Hebrews. But he was thinking in his mind what he already knew by revelation, but he was communicating it. So he communicates it this way, and this is the key to Enoch, is he believed in God, congratulations, but even the demons believe in God, but that he was a rewarder, a rewarder, a rewarder, a rewarder of those who diligently, diligently, diligently seek, seek him. So it's not, it's not just like, I don't know how to say this because I'm so upset right now about this everything because I feel embarrassed because I love everyone and I've been involved with so many different moves and different people and, and none of these moves should have ended but the overemphasis is that, is that we, we catch something in a, and we, we push it we push it past what we should and we neglect all the others and then what happens is the people suffer because they're like well you know, I had a death in my family, and I believed. And, you know, I, I gave all my money, and I can't pay my bills, you know. So you have these discrepancies. And most of these people will just push it off and say, well, you have lack of faith. Well, not so fast, because you're responsible. Paul was responsible. He was a father. So he's not going to leave people just because... Um, they're in trouble and they didn't receive. Jesus didn't leave people because they didn't receive. They, they said, I do believe, help my unbelief. I mean, the guy was at least asking for help. That's the way I find myself. And I'm, that's why I'm so vocal about it. I don't want people to think that I don't doubt at times. And I mean, even after being in heaven and everything, I mean, you know, I'm upside down in a fighter jet and a guy's like telling me, you know, no, if I yell bail out, you pull your shoe, you pull the canopy open and you bail. We're going to be doing some high G maneuvers. If it gets out of control and I say, bail, 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 he said, I will see you on the ground. I'm not waiting for you. So we get this briefing, and I'm like upside down, and I'm thinking, what was I supposed to do? <laughs> and then I realize, like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm about to become a captain in this airplane, and I'm, I'm hesitating about, because it's still, you know, you think 16 hours in one jet is a lot, but, you know, when you get in an emergency and you're flying upside down and all this stuff and all these different things, so what I'm trying to say is, is, you know, did the instructor, like, I, I said, okay, so it's a silver handle, it's right here, right? You know, no, I'm just kidding. We know that, but there's all these other steps because you want the airplane to be in a right position so that you don't hit the tail on the way out and, you, and things like that. You don't want to break anything if you don't have to. And there's all this stuff, okay? The only reason I'm saying all this is because with Christianity, I think ministers were lazy. Because I don't even know if I consider myself a minister. I mean, in this classification of what's, what's going on, I would rather just be Kevin, a believer. And I would, that's why Jesus talked to me. He just called me Kevin. And he didn't, like, designate me as anything. He just, I felt like he liked me, and he was my friend. But he was very, very stern with me at times, too. But he wanted me to get all this stuff. What I'm saying is this, when you have a, what, you would, what they would call a faith failure, like what do you do with that, especially if you're a pastor? And, and, and Kathy and I were pastors at one time, a couple of times. Well, the thing of it is, is that Jesus didn't give up on people. And he sat with them and he talked with them and he explained things in a slow manner and he, he coached people into faith. But if you think about what he was doing, he was fathering them. So the greatest of these things is not faith, it's love. Amen. So if there's faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of these is not faith. But that's what I thought when I left Brother Hagin's school. But it wasn't his fault because he, he, doesn't, he doesn't believe that. But you, the overemphasis and then the people that were under him, which you can all name, they were just under him, but they, you know, they were just taking what he was saying but what I'm saying is, was there a real transfer of the, the real reality of, of what that man went through? 
How do you transfer that? So I feel like if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to get three by five cards from you. I'm going to talk to you straight across. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, what do you all need? You, you know, and I'm going to ask you to really listen to me and to interpret the scriptures according to the way the author was writing it. And, and forget about the Greek and the Hebrew. Just, just concentrate on the English for a while and know that there was a thought process and that, that these men and women of God were wanting to communicate truth to you so that you could walk in it, not to brag about what they were walking in. I don't consider Paul bragging about what he was walking in. But you'd think today, I mean, every, every, every YouTube channel you click on, it makes it look like, well, you know, I'm walking in this, and this, I'm in this portal right now. And I'm like, what's, what's, what's a portal? <laughs> it's like, to me, Jesus Christ being crucified makes it open heaven. I don't need to look for a window. I got, I got, I got the sky. Did you hear what I just said? Because, oh, well, there's certain places on the earth. I'm like, I'm not, I don't want any of those portals. There might be something else in there. You know, I don't, I don't have any trouble when there's a full moon, but everybody else does. If I see an owl, I don't think I'm going to die. I'm not superstitious because the superstition brings fear. Okay, Paul said, listen then, you might be full of faith and know that that meat that you bought down at the market, which was half off, is because it was offered to idols and, and you got it for 50% off. It was offered to idols, but there's no cooties in it. Paul said, you know that because of your faith. But if someone sits down with you and, and wants to take a bite of that hamburger and they ask if was this offered to idols, you, you have to tell them yes and then you have to remove it. He said because of their weak faith. No, he goes through and you can do this with anything. Like tomorrow, I'm going to preach and then I have to fly four flights to get my, my staff home. Four flights. I will be home at dark. And then I have to go fly a fighter jet. Now, tomorrow's a Sabbath. But see, today's a Sabbath. And actually, if you take a day off, it is a Sabbath. And actually, it says that we've entered into the Sabbath rest already. So I'm kind of resting and chilling already, you know. I'm in Destin Beach right now, you know. But in the spirit. But... God knows that we would work all the time, and it's not what is good for us. So Sabbath was made for the man to help us. So tithe was made for the man to unhook us from the world system, honoring God with a portion so it unhooks us from the world system. That way the, the, the devourer is rebuked and the windows of heaven are open. It was just to, to make it known to yourself that God is your source. That's all that is, is to help you. Everything that is given is to help you. So faith is actually the secret of faith is knowing that God rewards those who diligently seek him. And that faith is action. It's not believing. Because you have to believe in your heart, but you have to say it with your mouth. It says believe in your heart and say it with your mouth and what you say will be done for you. I mean, this is Jesus. It's not Kenneth Hagin. This is in red. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say what you believe in your head. It says what you believe in your heart. So I'm telling you all, I know that you've been taught wrongly. But you can believe in your heart and have faith in your heart and doubt in your head. And you can still get it. Oh. It says believe in your heart and say it with your mouth doesn't say believe in your head. It's, it's a heart matter. Faith is of the heart. You all need to be released because you're in a war down here and you can't help the bullets that are flying by you mm -hmm. and, and your crazy family. <laughs> in other words, there's all stuff going here. That's, that's part of this realm. That, that, as soon as I came back, it started again. It was fine when I was with Jesus because I didn't have that but when I got back here 
all the realities of Jesus Christ were in my heart now. They were not in my head. I had to bring them up, constantly putting the Word of God before me, even though I had seen Him in pure sight and, and met Him and heard Him speak, and He quoted Himself for 45 minutes, it started to fade. And I knew it. It's just like when, you, when I was talking about those maneuvers, I'm thinking in my head, okay, I'm going to do this, do this, do this. I'm going to start passing out at this point, so i got to keep this up, then relieve it, and then my blood will come back. And, and you have to get used to that. you got an instructor with you, you get used to that. But one day, you're going to be flying by yourself, and you're going to have to know how much you can handle. And what I did was, when Jesus said, you're going back to your body, as soon as he said that, I started feeling this pull back to my body on the operating table. But I was facing him, and he... And the, doctors, the doctor and the nurses were behind me, and I felt a pull. I felt like it was being vacuumed back into my body. And he's looking at me, and at that moment, I, I remember looking in his eyes and being pulled back, and I said to myself, just like I do before I fly these planes, okay, I rehearsed everything. When I get back in my body, I get back on the earth, got to remember this, this, and this, and i got to hold on to this the rest of my life. And that's what I do every day now. I actually, in prayer, I just go back to that place where I was with Jesus. And I remember the relationship I had with him. And I might feel like he hates me. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth is that if you go by your feelings, you, it's across the board, across, it doesn't matter how much faith you have. If you go by your feelings and your thoughts, everyone has the same thoughts and feelings. We all struggle with the same thing. No one wants to tell you that but I don't care. I really don't care what you think about me. I didn't come back to convince you. I just came back to give this message out and bring the body of Christ together, and then I'm out of here. And I'll be waiting for you if I go first. And I'll, I'll put a good word in for you. But, but down here, you have to like, oof. So it's so funny is, is that you, know, you, you go from one airplane to the other, you go from one person to the other, you go, you're there here and you got to talk this way, and then you're in this airplane, and then you got to do this check ride with this FAA guy, and he's like this, so you got to remember that, and he likes to see this. And then you go to this airplane, and you're upside down most of the time, and you know, you got to watch your fuel, you got to watch this, you got to, and you have to coach yourself. And, and it's like when, like when we talk about spiritual things and, and, and being a Christian and things, the ministers don't do anything. They just like throw it out there, take your offering, and then they go home. And that's like, that, like, well, what about like Jesus discipling people and being there with them and helping them along? That's, what, that's why I, I was able to do what I've done is I was mentored by the best in all these aircraft. Every aircraft I'm in, I'm with the best. Even the FAA people that I go to are the best. Everybody's top notch. When I went to Kenneth Hagin school, top notch. I mean, it was like heaven on earth. I had the best. But when I got out, and you're now on your own, you have to be able to do those things that they were doing, and you've got to be able to teach other people, and everybody's watching you. So there has to be some sort of manifestation. And what I found is, is the key is, is that you have to know that God is pleased with you, and that he, he will reward you when you diligently seek him. So the only thing that I can think of to do is create an environment for growth for people because it, it, it births faith. So it's not how many scriptures you know, it's how many you live. It's what you experience. So I would start with Isaiah 6 and just look at the throne room and read it over and over again and then after a while, you're going to feel like Isaiah. You're going to be undone. And then you read Jeremiah, and it's like, I'm going to shut up because everybody's persecuting me. No one even pays attention to me. God says, don't look at their faces. Keep talking. They're like, no, I don't want to. I'm done. And so he said, I'm going to shut up. Well, that lasted just a few months. And then he said, the fire started burning in my bones. See, if you concentrate on that, I believe that's what faith is. Faith is an impartation of someone else that has already walked in it. I don't think you can, I know, I know, I know. I'm listening to myself talk. But see, it's discipleship. You can't just throw it out there and then give you the keys to a jet. 
So, like, if that's stupid, and you know it is, then why would Christianity be any different? Why would Paul and Jesus to throw things at you, and if you didn't get it, you just have a lack of faith? Well, what happens when something bad happens? And you're trying to figure out and file it. Like, what was it my fault? Was it God's fault? Well, don't say that, please. Just because when I was in heaven, that's one thing you'll never do. <laughs> you will go up to him, and you will like, you never mind. <laughs> Whatever, whatever you have with him, it, it just you're, you're not going to get, you're not going to be near the throne if you have, it. there will not be anything within you. I didn't blame God for anything. It was pretty clear that I had every opportunity and that we were in a broken world and things happened. And that sounds oversimplified, but you got to remember, Jesus said you got to take it like a child. And there are things that you may never be explained about. I just want you to know, you may go be in heaven a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years, and you still, you still don't know what happened on the earth, and you don't care. You don't, it doesn't come up. I'm just telling you. You want to be in heaven. You, you want to go there as fast as possible. But down here, if you still wake up tomorrow morning, you better be swinging and beating the devil up. You better be preaching the gospel and encouraging people in the good news and preaching exactly what Jesus preached. Even if you are not seeing yourself healed, you've got to preach healing. Even if you're not delivered, you've got to preach deliverance because he is a deliverer. You're not. You, you have to preach the good news because the standard in this generation has to ma be maintained. That's what Satan is after right now. And, and this thread that's in me is supernatural. And... and, and I never got that foul disease, even all the alphabet, every one they went through, every animal that they went through. But that was because I, was, I, was, I had reduced it to my covenant with God. And, and, you know, and I was hurt because I was saying, listen, what, where's everybody else at? Where's all the healers? Where's all the, all the people that have the gifts of healing? You know, the, all my friends, they were like hiding in caves. So I kept preaching. I, I, they, they, it's like they, they restricted me to my studio. So I just backed into my studio, and for months, I preached this seminar every weekend. Like stuff like this, I preached healing, deliverance, God loves this country. I preached, you could just look at them. For two years, I just kept playing. And I told the devil every time, you can watch them, you either let go or I'll keep, I'll keep coming to the studio. And he would, pull the, he would pull the electricity off. He would do everything to, he could to the building to stop it. And I just kept preaching. But what I'm saying is, did God stop healing during this, this, this two years? Was he in any way diminished in any way? Okay, so let's be honest. Let's be honest. Were, were we really where we needed to be? Okay, but it was, a, it was a good test. Even though people lost their lives and it was diabolical, you don't want to know the truth. Trust me. But I want to stay on the air, so I'll just leave it at that. Backing out of that cave. Okay, for you now... In order to be effective, you have to realize that the only thing God requires of you is that you know him enough to trust him, which is faith. Now, I'm telling you the truth. You can either study it yourself or just take it from me. The word for, for faith in, in Old Testament is the word trust. So it, it became something else very gradually. And I'm not saying, I'm not criticizing anyone because I learned and I, I developed through all these people. But it's interesting to me that I chose, out of everyone, that I chose Brother Hagen. He's, he's, he's preaching in my house right now. He's playing constantly. But I chose, the Lord told me two things. You watch Andrew Walmack. You watch him twice a day, you buy everything he has, and for 10 years, without a pulpit, without a place to preach, never asked to preach. I bought everything he had, I listened to everything, and I sat and wept. I listened to Brother Hagen all the time, for 10 years, and didn't have a place to preach. No one would listen to me. These people had fruit. They had manifestation of that. And, 
And I paid for everything with Andrew Womack and with Brother Hagen. But Andrew Womack said, if you don't have money, just let us know. We'll send it to you for free. But me, Kathy and I, we would literally pick up extra work to afford these things. And we would buy them with, with money that we really didn't have. And, and my office is full. And I told Kathy, I said, eventually, like, I didn't want to be in the ministry because I felt like faith was, was not the greatest that love was. And even though I had the degrees on my wall, I felt like people like Andrew Womack, they really cared. Like, he, they actually, like, cared for people, too. You could feel it. Whereas other people were kind of saying it, and it was like they were talking about themselves and bragging all the time. And I thought, well, you know what? Why would I want to waste my time? I'll just stay at Southwest Airlines. You know, I'd rather just have a job and, you know, you know, help at the church and everything. And so that's what we did. But this is what changed my life was when, when I realized that he was, that Andrew Womack had gone through the same things that, that Kathy, and I told Kathy, I said, I, will, I would be in the ministry if I could sit at a nice wooden table with a fireplace behind me and talk real slow and talk to people straight across like we were friends and, and, um, and just really genuine love people and then give it away for free if they didn't have money. And just do stuff for people without them even asking and just make it like you don't have to give, you know, but you should give, but you don't have to. Only because it's a, there was such an overemphasis of giving, you know. And like I, I joke, I just joked where I was out in Longview or whatever, that, you know, I'd go to church and I'd hear an hour long offering teaching and then a 30 minute sermon. I got the offering down, buddy, okay? <laughs> but I want to know, I want a hot meal. And so that's not everybody. But this is the kind of thing I saw. So I told Kathy that. I said, you know, and I had already had this experience with Jesus, and Kathy was the only one that really knew about it. And I wasn't allowed to talk about it for 13 years. And then one day the Lord appeared to me and said, it's time. It's a mandate. You must write that book. And then Kathy came to me. She goes, the Lord told me you need to write that book. I go, yeah. It's like, it's just an echo in this room because you just, you know, Jesus has just told me. And so I did it, but I didn't do it for the money because I would have made millions if I would have came out with it right away. And, and I didn't do that. I waited 13 years and something happened in me. And so now I don't write books for money. I don't, I don't do anything for money. But sometimes people will look at the bottom line and say, I need to come out with a new book. Or I need to push the offering this week. Or I need to get another meeting in between meetings. Yeah. And I'll spend time pulling money out of your wallet. And what happens to you is you're robbed of your relationship and your faith with God because you should give not out of compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. Actually, it, the word is hilariously joyful. So if you're not laughing and doing the offering, I'm going to give your offering back to you. Because I want to see you, like, I want to know that you like hearing from God. And I'd rather, rather you give it to a single mom anyway, because that's what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, we, we don't give it all to single moms. But I made a point when I got a job as a pilot because I need to build my hours really quick. I, I, flew, I flew for a charter company as a first officer. And every month I gave my paycheck to a single mom because I didn't need the money. And I did that every month. And if you watch all the films, I do it every time. And then now I'm not working. I got that job for about a year and I don't need it now. I have a, I'm busy enough flying around now. But my point is this, if you want to know the secret to Enoch and why he pleased God, he, he understood the, the trust and the relationship, but it took 300 years. It took a long time in the Old Testament for Moses and Noah and all these people to get to where they were. Does everybody get that? So in this life, with what we have now, we don't have that time. And the government's here to help us to shorten our life, you know. But it's, it's a squeeze. So I used to joke at, at the airline, they, the, the, the pilots and the flight tests, we would, all, we would do everything together. I mean, I wouldn't sleep together with them, but I mean everything else together. I, was, I didn't drink with them. I didn't do any of that stuff. But we did everything together. We were together. And it was, a, it was the best company to work for. It was, it was the best people. When I was at Rama, I, it was the best group of friends I've ever had. I wish I could have them all with us on our staff, every last 34 of them. I would take every one of them. Just quality people. But I don't know any of them that are in the ministry now. 
But I think about, as Southwest, we used to joke about, um, well, when are you going to retire? And they were talking about Social Security and, the, and all that. You know, and the pilots are really money-minded and, and um, good with numbers. And so they're like, well, you know, you know, this and this and this. And I go, well, you're calculating off of living 72 years or 80 years or whatever. Um, I'm going to live to be 120 because I want the Social Security to have to go in the red with me. <laughs> uh, to where like, they're, like, they're like after me. Like, why won't he die? <laughs> See, that's the way I think. It's like, because when I was on the other side, I'm going to explain this to you. Enoch understood that he was already in the eternal realm. So what you don't understand about Enoch, that you will read about his three visions on your own. I'll let you hit that <laughs> hornet's nest. Because Jesus quoted Enoch all the time, because you can see in there that's only an Enoch. Like when he said, weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's only an Enoch. That phrase is only in, in Enoch. So where did Jesus get that? Well, he was a son of God. He could have pulled it out of his hat, but he didn't wear a hat. But he, 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 read, he read all the writings, and everybody read Enoch. It just disappeared out of the, out of the, the writings at a later date. But you're going to find that Enoch was in visions and crossing over all the time. It just didn't happen. He was back and forth. So at the end, he just didn't come back. And I just saved you like, you know, 20, 20 days of reading it, if you want, and trying to figure out what they're saying. But there are cleansed versions of it that the Lord allowed me to, to like I told you, that, to, to read it. But here's what I got from Enoch, is that it became his, a common, walking with God was common to where this realm was not restrictive. That's a mouthful, isn't it? This is what, this is, this is what I give to you that I can tell you, if you want to have faith, you have to hook up and trust God that he knows more than you, and that he's pleased with you, and that he wants to reward you. And you create a relationship to where he can tell you, like he has with me. I've had people call me. And see, and this is not going to go over well, so you know, get ready to leave if you're, if you're going to get offended fast. But I've had people call me and say, will you pray for this person? So I go to pray for them. The Lord says, Let it, don't pray. I'm, I'm, I'm taking them. It's their, this is the best time for them to go right now. Did that with my dad. We got him healed of cancer once, and then it came back. And there are people that the Lord will not allow me to pray for. Well, that goes over well in my circles, right? right. Okay. But the thing that is, is the Lord, this is between me and them. This is the best time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I, I mean, I told them, some of them are my employees. I said, they're, they're going to be with the Lord. <laughs> Let them go. I'm not praying. A week later, they're gone. My dad, same way. Then Keith Ellis, you know, my friend, the prophet, who he goes, you know, I, I told him about my dad, and I, I went to, I just mentioned my dad, and he's back in the hospital again. That's all I said, nothing, just to, you know, ting him a little bit. He goes, well, you know, sometimes you just got to let him go. It's his time, you know. And that's what the Lord already told me. But, you know, Keith would never say anything unless the Lord said, and he said certainly it's my dad. He's not going to say, let him die, you know. He's a pastor. He's not going to just say that. What I'm trying to tell you is, is you're going to hear a lot this year from me that's the other side of things that nobody's saying. And that is, is that a lot of times people are going through things and ministers are going through things. They're hurting. They're, they're having money problems. They're having health problems. And they don't want to say anything. And they end up dying in just shock. Like, I didn't know he had cancer. Or she had this or that or whatever. It's because they don't, they, they feel like they've got to maintain something on the surface. But what they need is the body. They need the body to help. Because, you know, it, it's... I'm not saying you shouldn't pray in tongues on the way to the hospital. If you're in an emergency and you're in an ambulance, pray in tongues. But um, trust me, when I was on the other side, I can help you not ever get in an ambulance. But it's going to take... It's going to take you unraveling Satan's strategies in your life to where it, it never happens. You mess with the dials, and you're never there for the setup. Yeah. 
Did everybody understand what I said or should I like say it all again? Do you understand what I just said? Satan, it takes a long time for him to strategically set you up to nail you on something. Yeah. So God's trying to tell you not to eat bacon anymore because of the curing and because of the nitrates that are in there and it causes cancer. And there's other foods that do this, macaroni and cheese, things like that. Sorry, Kraft. Then, <laughs> and the pigs are like, yeah, get more, preach it. P the pigs are like, yeah, please. Thank yeah, the bearded pig, you know. And the pampered pig, you know. My thing is, is that Lord, the Lord has warned me long time ago about certain things, and I just listened to him. Then later on I find out, but it wasn't out at the time, and then I realized, oh man, I wonder how many people have died of things that could have been prevented. And I was this close to bringing down a bottle of a supplement, because I don't promote anything, and I'm not multi-level on anything, I don't sell anything, I just, I just, but I, I just came out with a health program for the school that'll be coming out. It'll be published soon. And I just let out everything, but it's because I'm not, I'm not a medical doctor or a nurse, and I, I'm not really, my two or three minutes a day that I have left, I don't want to do that degree. I want to just kind of stay, you know. But I, I talk about a whole bunch of things that, that are amazing. But I almost brought this bottle down because that's how much it's in my spirit. Because of the, the news for the last couple of years about, excuse me, Roundup and about uh, that whole thing. And if you look at the chemicals, and I don't want to mention because all the algorithms, everything I say, the intelligence agencies and all, all the algorithms will flag me with any, they have, the, they have the keywords in there already. I know how this works because I'm on the other side of this. So I have to be careful when I mention certain things, all the powers that be, that they get notified. And that's what happened you know, what you just saw what happened with, you know, number 45 and all that. It all had to do with, with controlling the information. Okay, but I, I almost brought this bottle down because I've just about had it. Because I cannot believe there's only one supplement on Amazon. And see, I didn't want to say it because then you'd buy it all and then I wouldn't be able to have any. Because that's what happens. I mention it and then I can't get it anymore. But you wouldn't believe what if you investigate it and you look at what's put what's put in your body already and you look at this these things are in pesticides and things like that and they're in your bodies right now and they take the place of, of an amino acid called glycine so glycophate is the poison that they got billions of dollars against them because it and there's it's surprising that there is a natural supplement on Amazon that will take it, take it out of your body. I'm, I'm encouraging you to do this without mentioning any names. The reason why is when I take it, I cannot believe how, I, how and I'm not even selling it. And, and I, I should call them and say, hey, I'll, I'll give you, a, you give me a, you know, a hit on this and uh, you know, I, could, I, I could sell this for you. But I'm not, I'm just telling you all that these things were always uh, uh, these things were always happening to you, and people were dying of cancer, and they thought they were just killing their weeds. So how many people had to die before they, they got caught? Do you get it? Okay, this is the way it is, spiritually, is, is stuff is happening all the time, and God's trying to tell you things, spiritually. But you have to frame your mind so that you can receive the information. If not, it's, it, there's nothing to talk to you that, that is congruent inside of you to, 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 for the Lord to do it. So with us, sometimes it'll be a word that comes out when we're praying in the Spirit. It'll come out in English. And then we have to look it up in the dictionary, and then it's on Amazon, and we buy it. And that's how we found out about NAC and all these other things that I've talked about. And it's like a miracle, especially uh, alpha-lipoic acid. Unbelievable. And I have, oh, please don't leave. Oh, that's staff. Okay. <laughs> the, the reason I'm saying this is that this life is about discovery, and you're never going to know everything, but what, what you don't know is hurting you. You have to know what the Spirit is saying. Enoch had 300 years to be coached. But what, what was testified about him and all these people in the faith chapter you could save yourself a lifetime. You can save yourself 300 years if you had it. 
by just reading the little nuances on what was attributed to their faith. And you would get a balanced view, which would, not, would get you kicked out of maybe a faith school, but at least you would know that being sawn in two was actually a compliment. That they, they chose to do that to have a better resurrection. And you don't even know what that means. And, and I don't want that. I'd rather just stay in one piece and go to heaven. But these people chose to lose their head. There was a greater reward to be a martyr. So we don't have that revelation. I want to know why. Where's, why haven't the apostles and the prophets taught on this? Well, because for the obvious reason, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't gain an audience or money or anything else. It doesn't sell books. You, you, you want me to write a book on suffering? I guarantee you it'll sell like three copies. <laughs> Am I right? You know what's embarrassing? You write a book on love, it won't sell. In fact, some shows won't even have you on. I know this, but it's the greatest of it all. Okay, I'm all pointing this out to you to understand that we are in a better situation than Enoch because God has accelerated the learning process by placing the spirit inside of us instead of just upon us like it was in the Old Testament. So God sets in the church some to be, some, the fivefold. But he also says that the Spirit gives gifts severally as he wills, which are the nine gifts of Spirit. That's to everyone. Based on what I saw in heaven, I have the best gift. I can prophesy, I can pray in tongues and interpret, and I can teach. It is the, by far the best. The reason why is, is that when you teach, you, you can influence a lot more people and bring them up in understanding, which causes them to have encounters. So faith is experiential knowledge. It's not just knowledge. You can't just say you have faith. People will know you have faith by what you do. I mean, this is what Smith Wigglesworth said. And he, ra- he, ra- he was raising people from the dead, including his wife, because she died while he was out on the road, and he was mad. He took her out of the coffin, <laughs> slammed her against the wall. He did. He, he goes, why did you leave me? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> so he said faith is an act. Faith is an act. He would walk back and forth. That was a sermon. For five minutes, he would walk back and forth, saying faith is an act. So to me, Jesus said, produce fruit in keeping with your repentance. So repentance is just the beginning. Why do we make it the end? And why do we say we've repented and now we're Christian and we're waiting for the white horse to come back? Where, where, you know, God sends me back and then I wake up every morning and I don't want to be here, but I'm here. And I know what my assignment is, is to make it so uncomfortable for the devil that he never has a place to lay his head, ever. And anybody, not just me, but any of you, create a whole family all over the earth of warriors where they never let the devil rest. And they stand out. God answers their prayers because of favor. God has favored you, not because of good behavior, not because of your faith. The greatest of these is not faith, it's love. If you love one another, they're going to know that you are of me. That's what he said. Not if you have faith. Jesus said, when I come back, will there even be faith on the earth? Insinuating that there was not going to be. So you think it's bad now. You know where it's going. If Jesus is going to question if there's going to be faith on the earth when he returns. Okay, so back to Enoch, and then I'm going to move on here. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians, you can see it here, 5, 9, in, in the New Living Translation on page 3, it says, So whether we are here in this body or away from his, this body, our goal is to please him. So this is what Enoch was doing. 
he was he was in both realms, and you, you'll read this in his writings. When he it's like a journal. He's just writing about what he's his visions. And so if you can get the one that's taking the book of Noah out, it's pretty accurate, except for some of the things that are said in there, um, which I kind of alluded to. I just don't want the Smithsonian and all of them. I, I don't want them. I don't want to get dinged and get, get visited. What I'm trying to say is, is you don't know what the dinosaurs really looked like. Because the hybrid race was, was more messed up than you could ever imagine, and those bones are not... They're, they're not being uh, put together to, to represent what they really were. But I want to tell you something. I know something I can tell you that is the biggest hornet's nest that you can strike down here, I think. And that is, is that the whole dinosaur thing was Satan was trying to get himself off of his belly. It was a hybrid, it was an experiment, and Satan was getting himself back upright from the curse of being on his belly. Yeah, look at you. The whole thing was trying to reverse that curse. And they were interbreeding with each other and animals and, and beings. And there were, there were all these things going on that appeared to be like they were, they called them star gods. And if you look at Sumer, Ur the Chaldees, that's where all this happened. The reason it happened, and then please let me not have to ever say this again because I'm going to get in trouble because I know more than I should be talking about. When Nimrod fled, when he bailed because he was building those, those pyramids, and he was building one there, God stopped it. He headed east, and he hid, and he changed his name to Gil Gilgamesh, and he settled in Sumer, and that's where all the weird stuff goes. That's where all the origin of the UFOs and all that stuff comes. And all these ziggurats, all these things all over the earth, they were, they were put there to, to contact the heavens, not to reach the heavens. They were building them. They couldn't build them high enough to reach the heavens. It was to contact the heavens. They were portals. And the earth's gravitational field, everything was different when they built those things. It was easier than you think. Not only that, you can go different places. Can I please leave this? Nimrod is the Antichrist. Nimrod is the Antichrist. That spirit, that son of perdition. So that's why God went to Ur the Chaldees and grabbed one of the worshipers of the, of the moon god. His name was Abram. He went where Nimrod fled and grabbed somebody and made him a nation made him God's people. He plucked right there in northern Kuwait, southern Iraq. He grabbed Abram and came against the Antichrist spirit and Nimrod and this whole thing, why he, fl why he flooded the earth. See how you need to study some more? Paul talks about the son of perdition, the Antichrist. These, these beings were supernatural. Nimrod was a, in Hebrew, Hagaborim. That's what they used for the mighty ones. It says he was a mighty one on the earth. He was one of the giants, if you want to call him a giant. They weren't just giant in size. The word doesn't mean that. It means mighty one. They just happened to be genetically altered and were large. But they were all kinds of sizes and shapes, and, and uh, some of them looked like creatures. That's why when you see demons, you see all kinds of things. Half animal, half human, you see all these different like species. That's because the world that was, was like that. Those are the disembodied creatures and, and spirits. Not all animals have spirits, of course. I'm talking about the human things that were interbred. How many times do I have to go over this? I, I'm like, I'm very frustrated because people are like, well, then who are the sons of God? No, like I just told you. Who, well, who are the Nephilim? Well, they're the fallen angels. No, I thought those were the hybrids. No, the hybrids were the result of the sons of God with the daughters of men. Well, when, when did the Nephilim come in? They fell and they taught them how to do this. Now, see, you'd think everybody would understand it. I, I mean, it's, I just did that. It's like a four-week course. I just did it in three minutes. But this is what, the reason why people don't understand and can't grasp it is because we've been bamboozled. We've been told things that aren't true. 
So Enoch was dealing with all of these things when he was living. All these things were going on, and he had to preach and prophesy. So when you read his writings, he's being sent out, and the angels are actually pleading with him that fell. They're like, can you please get us back? We didn't know. And what happened was they fell with Hillel, Lucifer, because it was rank, like I said last night, okay? So all this stuff is real intense at the time that he's living. And so it forced him into a, a time of having to learn it really quickly in order to survive. Same with Noah, Noah was the same way. It was so intense. Only eight were chosen to be on the boat. That means all those people on the earth were hybrids. Because it says he was the only one perfect in his generations, him and the eight. So the only ones who were qualified to get on the boat. Does everybody understand this? Okay, so you have to understand that because of the intensity of that, it was a negative environment, but it caused growth. Men and women walked with God, but there were only a few. By the time Noah had the handoff, Enoch, Methuselah, all these guys had walked with God and had passed away or had been taken, and then it just kept getting worse to where there's only eight left out of millions. And the animals that were on the ark, they were chosen because they had an interbred. It was terrible to live in that time, and yet Enoch walked with God because he knew that God was a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, okay? This will hit home if you think about even the skeletons and knowing about the mighty ones and they, were, they were, had psychic powers, they could control your mind, throw fear at you. Don't ask me how I know all this stuff because I'm not going to answer you. But I'm telling you, you would not want to live in those days. But see, that is what's, what's wanting to happen behind the scenes right now. Right now. Right now, they want to alter your DNA. They're already, they're already doing it, but you just don't know it. And you think it's macaroni and cheese. But you, you have to start asking questions. Why are, are you doing what you're doing? Why are you taking what you're taking? You have to start asking yourself, are you hooked? Is this really helping? Do you need to go to someone who can actually resolve it? You just ask these questions because there's good doctors. I have good doctors, and I have to go to several because I got this. That's a special doctor, and then I've got just a, the practice of family practice, main thing. And I'm just telling you, I'm t I, I don't like it, but my thyroid, by flying all the time and being in that radar, my thyroid started acting up. And that's what happens to most flight crews. So every morning I take that pill and I say, I'm taking my healing. I, I receive my healing. I am, I am, I am on my way. I am, I am the healed of the Lord. But see, you now what faith preacher would tell you that? I'm believing God for healing. I've seen so many things healed in my body. It's, it's a short list now. But it's not right to hide things from you. Because then, then you think that I'm better than you, and then you, what you're going through is not. Enoch was the same way. All these people went through this stuff. They, 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 they fought fear all the time. They had these giants. They had all these creatures. They had all these things happening. They had things floating in the air. It's all a scam. It's all deception. There are no aliens. All that is, is, is an end time deception, and the governments are involved. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Okay. And I don't even get a patch on my, on my shoulder for that one, but I'm telling you because you need to know that there are certain supplements you can take that if you listen to the Spirit, it'll take this stuff out and you will never develop what could be developed. But the Spirit is trying to tell you things, get it over to you, and has been doing it for years. Uh, I, I know. I know I should be dead many times, even after coming back. But the Lord aborted it because he rerouted me, because he could talk to me and say, listen, man, you need to do this. You need to go this way. You need to cancel this flight, go here. You need to not go here. You're going there next year. You're not talking to this person anymore. Delete their phone number. And I've just learned to just do it. And I still don't know. I still don't know this day. But then I was shown how I'm still alive because I trust God. And he talks to me in a relationship. And at any one moment, he could take me. And you better not cry. And I'm telling you why. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. 
No, my relationship with God is, is, is a relationship that everyone's supposed to have, not just the super apostles and things like that. We have to get out of this, what Jesus meant, prefer, he, he referred to it as the Pope mentality. He told me, he says, it's happening again. There's too much reliance on the fivefold ministry. He said, so turn it back over to the body. He said, start to teach and, and activate everyone so that they can rise up and start praying for each other. And, and the corporate anointing was stronger than any apostolic anointing or prophetic anointing. The corporate, all of us agreeing is touching any one thing. The devils don't have a chance. It breaks the powers over Jacksonville or wherever we're at. And that's what these spirit schools are for. Okay, so the Lord said, I, I only have days now to get people to walk in what they have. He told me that in person. He said, Moses, I had years to prepare him. I took him 40 years into and, and the Pharaoh and to the Egyptian university. He was being uh, groomed to be, it was the greatest university. And he, he was going to be the Pharaoh. Then he put him in the Midian desert for 40 years. And that was the desert that they actually were, had to transverse through. So he actually knew the desert like the back of his hand because he, he was a shepherd. And, and it was only supposed to take 14 days. Because of their rebellion, God knew that. He trained Moses for 40 years in the desert. He knew the people were going to rebel, but it wasn't his perfect will. Okay, that's where we're at right now. We're in the desert. It's supposed to take 14 days. It's, it's, we're in the desert now. We're in the desert right now. Now, the desert was... God said that I put you in the desert to see what was in your heart, to, to test you to see what was in you. And he wanted to divorce the people because they were stiff-necked, rebellious, and unbelieving. And so he wanted to wipe them out like he wiped out Genesis 6. And Moses stood in the gap like Jesus would and, and, and said, no, they're your people. They're not my people. They're your people. And you can't do this because then everyone will say that you brought your people out here to kill them. And so Moses said, we're not going if you're not going with us. And so God was forced to send the angel. Well, you know, don't grieve him because he will not tolerate your sin either, is what God said. Well, they all fell in the desert. Every last one of them fell anyway. But at least Moses stood up for the people. So Jesus did the same thing. We should all be dead. Jesus stood up and said, you can't do this. I will be a redeemer. And he, he, he bought us. So in the New Testament now, you can accelerate the learning process because he, he gave us the Holy Spirit within us. And think about this. The rudder is, is your tongue, right? It, it guides your whole life, James says. So it's a big ship, small rudder, and it steers your life. And the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost came and reversed the curse at Babylon with the languages. He reversed it. And he took over your rudder. The Spirit of God took over your tongue. He's got you. He can steer your whole life. So I know this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand this over. Um, but I, I want you to know that that time with Jesus, I saw that we were better than Enoch. We have an advantage way better. It's just that you need somebody like me in a flight suit to tell you you can do it. <laughs> somebody that you can relate to. And I, you know, if you notice, we don't even take in, we're not even taking offerings. So you, know, you, you can listen to the Spirit of God and, and you can realize that this is all rigged. The Spirit wants to say some things through you to create a transaction that because you're legally here, Satan is not legally here. He took over illegally. We are here because we were born through a, a, a birth canal, through a womb. Because we are legally born, we are legally here and legally human. So, at least I have a birth certificate. I can even be president. <laughs> but I'm legally here, and I have a belly button, so I have authority. But you don't want to speak on your own, because Jesus didn't even speak on his own. And he said, when the Spirit comes, he's not going to speak on his own. So why are ministers speaking on their own? So the, the, the key here for all of you students, every one of you in this room here in Jacksonville, you've got to yield to the Spirit and say something from the other realm. It's a transaction that will make devils bail. 
because it's a legal transaction and they have to listen. See, you think, okay, this all happened. It looks like there's certain things reversing and there's like new people coming in. And well, you, you got to give yourself credit. You prayed. We agreed together over the last several years. Some of the things that have happened, like Roe versus Wade, that's a miracle. Yes. Okay? Amen. But why, why would, I told Kathy, I walked off a, a Daystar television and I had announced that, that Roe versus Wade will be, a, will be reversed. And I was, I, was, I was scared. I go, what did I just say? <laughs> it's like, how am I going to get out of that one? I thought, and, and it happened. But it's a miracle. But it wasn't from, it wasn't originating from man, that knowledge. That came forth. But then you got to give yourself credit that we all prayed and agreed. And you got to see the cracks that are coming and being a parent and things. You can't give up in prayer. But we got to finish this race with love, in love. You know, if you meet, if you meet these people, they trusted God. They didn't force him or manipulate him. They didn't give to get. They had a relationship with God. The Jesus I met, he taught me that it was more about authority with finances. And he also taught me that he told me, I mean, I might as well, I've, I've, and they're all watching, all my friends are watching anyway. <coughs> Jesus told me, he said, I don't, I don't make people prosperous because they'll, they'll, I'll lose them. And that's a quote from Jesus. He said, I, I can't trust them. I'll lose them. They have to be able to be trusted with little so that they be trusted with great riches, is what Jesus said. And so it's hard for a rich man to get to heaven because it's hard to deal with the power that you have to not have to pray for anything. You just go and write a check. That's what he told me. I'm being too honest, but I, I'm just telling you that's what he told me. He said, I don't want to lose people. Can you believe that? Well, that goes over well. I mean, you know, that's my next prosperity book, you know. That'll go, that'll, that'll go over well. That, that, the thing that is, is God gives us wealth because he trusts us. It's faith. But it's not the faith like this thing where you get it. I think you're way further than, I don't have to explain myself. So, Anyway, um, you've got the mentality now of Enoch and these men and women that were in the Old Testament. The people in the New Testament, they didn't count their life as anything. They were dead people walking. Paul said, listen, he said, I consider myself a happy man. But he was in jail when he wrote that. But he also said this. He said, he said my life is not my own, just like your life is not your own. He says, he said, it's as though God has borrowed my body and is doing his ministry through me. That's what one translation of it is. Is that he, he said, this is not me. It's Christ in me doing this work. And that's what I saw in heaven. And I thought, that's a big task to get over to people because how, where do you start with that? Because there's so much out there now. And what happened was when we got into hardship and things happen and people die and you lose your loved ones and you have things happen, then you, you, you have to, like I said, I started this talk with, you have to file it somewhere. But what it is, is that we need, we need sometimes hardship to mature in order to get the pace up and realize we should have watchmen and we should have people telling us. And that's what would happen when I was in running in races. We'd have people calling out our time so that we knew if we were behind or ahead. And it would manage that so that you ended up well if you didn't know. If you, couldn't guard, if you couldn't calculate, they would call things out to you. And that's what the computer does in our plane. It tells you how much fuel you have left and how many miles you have left. It tells you exactly when you'll touch down to the second. It tells you everything. And it manages everything for you. But see, if, if my plane can do that, well, don't you think God's spirit could do that for you? So don't you think like if, if, he, if he feels like you're prone towards something, maybe you should back off of something in order to stay another 20 years. I know this to be true. I know that if the spirit could get through to you, you would live a lot longer and that people would live a lot longer. But 
you know, the enemy doesn't want that to happen. And the powers that be that are entrenched with these demons don't want that to happen. They don't want you to live a long time. And this is what I saw, and I'll close with this. Satan, Satan does not want human beings to live very long on the earth because of he knows that this gospel is being preached. He knows that there's a harvest coming in. And I'm telling you, you can take it to the bank. You're going to find out about it. The Spirit of God is, is so strong now because Satan doesn't want people to live too long because they might hear the gospel. That's all this is about. It's about shortening everyone's life and keeping them entrapped with addictions and all the things that we all go through and we have to fight all the time here. And we're the church. You can't even trust some churches and ministries. It's, this has to clean, get cleaned up. And we all have to love each other and get together. And we have to let the Spirit talk to us. And He'll even talk to you about your finances, about your diet, about, your, about everything, about your relationships. It's just time. Let me pray. Let me pray. Father... I thank you so much for the example that you've given us through all these men and women of God that have lived throughout history. But Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who is the best example. And we thank you, Lord, now going forward, that you speak to us through your son in these last days, is what it says in Hebrews chapter 1. And so, Father, we embrace Jesus. And because we embrace him and his teachings, John 1.12 says that he, he gave us the power to become sons of God. And I take that, I take that now, all of us in this room take that, Lord. We receive that power. And that word for power was the word for authority. It gave us the authority to become sons of God. And I thank you, Lord, right now. Help us, Lord, to, to be able to file things the correct way. Lord, just counsel us and show us, Lord, that you, you are a good God and that you are working all things to the good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose in the name of Jesus oh Lord you're just going to love on us right now I can just feel it oh you're just loving on us you just love us Lord we're chosen we're a chosen generation we're going to do this Lord together oh Lord we, we know that you're going to reward us because we diligently seek you and we know Lord you got everything lined up Lord, you're going to help us with our bills and with our health and with our families. You're going to help us, Lord, with everything in our life. Lord, you just brought us to a time such as this so that we can know our, our purpose. We're chosen. <laughs> oh, do you just feel his love? He loves us. He's helping us right now. The Spirit is here to help us. He's helping us. He's comforting us. He's lifting us up into the heavenly realms. Lord, oh Lord, we don't have to go to you. You've come to us. Oh, <laughs> oh just let him love on you. Oh. I mean, I'm telling you, I can interpret my tongue. The Lord just said, don't you worry about a thing. I got this. That's what he just said. He said that to you all. I already know this, but I'm telling you, I, can, I prayed in the Spirit. I heard it in English. He said, don't worry about a thing. I got this. He's got your back. He's already plowed ahead of you. His angels are mighty and powerful. And they've been instructed to make a way for you. God is working. He's breaking addictions right now. He's breaking powers that you've been fighting. He's, he's sending angels ahead. And he's giving you the authority to address these things under the power of the Spirit now. So he's asking you to speak once again and to come against those powers that are operating in your life. And, and he, has, he has already predestined you to triumph because he always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always. Come on, we can all do this together. We can do this. Hallelujah. Oh, you are loved. You are appreciated. You are loved. You are appreciated. He's visiting us by His Spirit. Oh.
Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm going to let Kathy teach prayer school, and I will come back at 6, right? Yeah. At 6. And then um, we'll, we'll start worship. And I'm going to introduce them, and I'm going to let them talk first. I have friends here. Um, I don't know if you remember all the Hosanna albums. I had all 133 of them. Do you remember Hosanna and Integrity Music, you know? Do you remember all those? Yeah. Just nod your head. I know you're like, I can't believe he's talking. Like, I'm, I'm getting visited right now, you know? No, I know. But Charlie and Jill LeBlanc were on a lot of those albums. And I used to listen to all those albums. We had to sing them in our church suite. When we joined the, um, the singers, you, had, you got a box of all 130 of them, and you had to learn all those songs. And so um, they, they actually helped Andrew Walmack with his music and some other ministries as well. And um, they have played for us in the past, and they are here. They live in Jacksonville. And I just wanted them to share because they, they really have on their heart um, there's a certain aspect they'll share with you, and I just want to give them uh, 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'll have Kathy teach, and then you're, you're, you're uh, free to uh, stay or go, but I really encourage you, this is like a once-in-a-lifetime thing, and Kathy can really teach on prayer as well, and she's, she helps me pray, so um, and then we'll see you at 6 as well, so Charlie and Joe, why don't you come on up, and we, I love you guys. They have, hey man, thank you. <laughs> and and um, so I'm going to give them the microphone. Um, I already know what they're going to share on because I know I know what the Lord's ministering to them. But they're trusted by Andrew Walmack, and I trust them, and they played for us in the past. And um, I want them to share their heart with you on whatever the Lord tells them to, but I kind of know what vein it's going to be. And then Kathy will come up and finish with prayer, and then we'll see you. We'll start worship around 6, if that's okay. I love you all. Right. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, it's quite a, 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 an honor to be here and, and an honor to just uh, share with you just for a few minutes some of the things that God has been ministering to us pretty heavily. Um, you know, I love the way Kevin... Um, shares about Jesus and about God the Father and the love that we have there. It's, it's not normal to hear how much God loves us and the relationship that he desires with us is just incredible. And I love the way he shares this because this is something that is so important for us to understand. Jill and I have been we're graduates of Rama as well, way back in 1979, believe it or not. And uh, we traveled and sang. We met Andrew Womack back in 1981. And uh, we traveled with him and began to sing with him even this long, even in, to, to now. We're still doing conferences with him. In fact, there's one in Orlando in February you should all come out to if you can. But... Um, but we also had the privilege to travel with Joyce Meyer for seven years and, and do music for her as well. Wonderful woman of God, powerful minister. And God is, is pouring out his heart to his people. But something Jill and I learned after even all those years of being in ministry with them, we, we had a hard lesson to learn. We learned it through a tragedy in our own life. And um, 14 years ago, in fact, just last week, uh, my son, our son, we lost him to cancer. And we were broken. I mean, after all these years of being faith people, being people who preached the word, sang the word, wrote the word in song, worked with some of the greatest ministries in the world. Uh, we fought for our 23-year-old son. We prayed, we fasted, we did everything we knew, but we lost him. Now you say, Charlie, why? I'm not gonna get into all that right now. But what I am getting, where I'm going with this is we were broken vessels, totally hearts shattered. Our faith was shattered. 
our, our, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know if we would survive it, okay? And yet, in that broken state and in that uh, just loss of, loss of faith, our entire world was shattered. Our family was shattered. We have two daughters that live here in Jacksonville. Their hearts were shattered. And we didn't know if we would ever make it through. But we hung on by a thread. I should probably say God hung on to us because we, we didn't have anything to hold on to. But his love continued to reach out to us. And the scripture that I am so love so much is that the God is the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And his comfort and his passion and his passion for us, he never gives up on us. And even when we turn our backs on him, he doesn't turn his back on us. And he kept chasing us and loving us. And my dear wife, you know, we all process loss differently. Jill was, was extremely angry. I mean, she just, she was mad. And, you know, when we were brokenhearted, she was, her heart was, became stone for a little bit. And yet God was able to reach down with his love and continue to minister to us and continue to help us. And, you know, I want to say he used people as well. And that, that's a big part. He used people like Andrew Walmack and like, like Joyce Meyer and like other close friends. He used them to love us, not to teach us, not to rebuke us because we were sad. But he used them to love us and help, that love helped to bring us through this tragedy. And I just want to say a couple of side words about that. We're, in fact, releasing our first book after 40 years of full-time ministry. <laughs> and Kevin, in five years, has released <laughs> 65 or something. <laughs> we released our first one, praise the Lord. Now, we have... <laughs> Amen. Now, on the flip side of that, we've got about 20-something CDs that we put out. Okay, so that's fair, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but not 65 CDs. But nonetheless, um, we are putting out our first book, and it's a story about what we went through and how we recovered from this loss. I mean, we should have had worship books out by now. We should have had all this other stuff. But it's going to be weird because through Harrison House, actually, we're putting out our first book on, uh, what's the title of it? When Loss Comes Close to Home. Right. And it's to also, but more than telling our story, it's to give hope to the bereaved who have also suffered loss. And then it's also to share wisdom and offer help to those walking beside the bereaved so that you can be a better helper, so that you can say things that are helpful and, and know how to minister to them. So that's uh, yeah. primarily what the book is about. And so let me just say a couple last words. Number one, we cried a lot. Okay, uh, and I know that's weird. You say, you know, well, why are you saying that, Charlie? Well, it's because Kevin said it just a few minutes ago that ministers and a lot of Christians are afraid to be honest about their pain. They're afraid to be transparent. They're they're sick. They're struggling, and they're afraid to talk about it. And and especially in this area of loss, people that you know. They lose a loved one, they lose a mother, father, whatever, brother, sister, friend, and they're hurting. And they, they, they want to cry, but they feel like they can't. Listen, I have studied the word of God concerning weeping and tears, and it's all over the place. It's a holy thing. God, he, he keeps our tears in a bottle. I mean, Jesus loves us, and he doesn't mind us sharing our hearts with him and even our pain and our anger at times. He can handle it. I had one big biker friend of mine, Christian biker minister, and he said, he looked at me in the face just the, few, the day after Bo passed. He said, Charlie, God can handle it. He said, you be honest with him. You share your anger with him if you need to. He can handle it. And he did. And he loved us through all the pain. I just want to encourage you that God loves you so much. And no matter what you go through, he'll be there for you. If you ha just hang in there, just stick with him. 
You know, I, I remember the scripture, where else can I go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Where else can I go? And God just continued to, to reach out to us. He's a God of all comfort. He's a God of mercy. And like Jill said, if you know someone going through a, a hard time, it's not your responsibility to begin preaching to them the word and telling them what the Bible says, okay? It's your responsibility to love. In fact, a close friend of mine... Yeah, we'll yeah. just ask if you could pray for the ministry that about anyone who's experienced loss. Okay, yes, we will do that. Praise God. Thank you. Um, a year after we lost our son, a close friend of ours, who was a minister in South Missouri, his son died in a tractor accident. Our hearts break. Whenever we hear of anyone losing not only a child, but a loved one. Our hearts are shattered. I mean, we just, we understand that kind of pain. Comfort others with the same comfort that you have received of the Lord. So we understand that kind of pain. So we, we called them. We were actually in England with Andrew Womack at the time. And we called them and we wept with them. And, and we knew we'd be in town the next week. We said, would you like us to drive down from St. Louis, Missouri, down to Cape Toronto, I think it was, and minister for you on that Sunday morning, Farmington, I think it was. And they said, we would love it. Thank you for coming. Please come. So we went and I'm driving down there. This is a year after we lost our son. And all of a sudden my mind's going, what are you doing? You know, you have nothing to say. You're going to just walk into the pulpit and cry. You're going to try to sing a song and just remember your pain. You're going to cry. But I knew we were in the, on the mission from God. And the Lord spoke to me this simple word. I'm going to leave you with this and pray for you. As I'm driving down, I said, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. He said, Charlie, this. He said, Charlie, tell the people, you do the loving and I'll do the fixing. That was simple, but that's what he told me. And, and I'm not, I'm from Louisiana, originally born there, but I'm not a Southern guy to say fixing and a loving and all this kind of stuff, you know. But the Spirit of God knew that they were country folks. They had horses. They, were, they grew up on farms and everything. And the Lord said, tell them, you do the loving, and I'll do the fixing. And so that was a message that just pulled, we ministered to the people, and that's what I want to minister to you in closing. Just remember, love is, you've been saying it all morning, love is the most powerful thing above all the faith schools and everything we've done. And love is the most powerful thing. And when someone's in pain and hurting, you can love them. You may have a whole bunch of scriptures going around in your mind of, to teach them, to teach them, to teach them. No, no, no. Hang on to that, okay? You know, like people would come to, oh, Charlie, your son's in heaven. Praise the Lord. Amen. I say, you want to just shut up right now? You have no idea what kind of pain I'm in right now. And, and also, uh, you know, we know, obviously, we knew instantly where our son went. We, we rejoiced in that. But the pain of loss is beyond words. How many have experienced that kind of loss? You know what I'm talking about, right? And you were afraid, many of you, to say anything at a certain time. You were afraid that someone would rebuke you because you were trying to express your heart. But I want you to know, God never rebukes you. He looks to you with his loving arms. His arms come around you. Even now, we love you. And we believe that God will continue to minister grace to you. Just 14 years later now, we were crying just last week with our daughters. We went out to eat with our two daughters. And they gave us a gift, something that had to do with our son. And at the table, I wept uncontrollably. I couldn't, I mean, I'm in a restaurant, you know. But I just had to, I couldn't stop it. It was this, this thing that was just coming through me. And, and I thought, it's fine. God loves me. Amen. And God loves you. So if you will, maybe, maybe let's stand up together. I'm sure some of you could use that. And if you will, just lift your hand high. If you've gone through, I'm sorry, not everyone, but if you've gone through something that a loss of something, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's a career, Maybe it's a, a, a friend or a loved one. If you've been through something and, and it's hurt and you've not been able to handle that, we just want to pray for you. Father, we thank you for that. You are the God of all comfort. Father, the Father of mercies. You healed the broken hearts, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you for your healing love, Father God. 
Your love abounds, Lord Jesus. Right now, Father God, I just pray for your healing touch on each one. If you're around a person with their hands raised, I want you to hand, put your hand on them as, a, as an act of love and let them know that they are loved, not criticized, not judged in any way. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your healing touch, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the work you're doing in them. Father, that you're going to continue to bring comfort, comfort and peace and healing to their heart, to their soul, Father God, that's been damaged through this loss. Father, you are near the brokenhearted. Hallelujah. <laughs> you are close to the brokenhearted, Lord God. Oh, Jesus, we thank you that you wept, Jesus. You understood pain in humanity. Hallelujah. You would touch with the feelings of our infirmities, Lord. We pray that you bless each one, Lord. Strengthen them in their journey of life. No matter what comes their way, Lord, I thank you that you're with them. Hallelujah. No matter what they're going through, Father, you are with them always, even into the ends of the earth. And we give you praise for that, Lord. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you have anything you want to share? Okay, God bless you. Thank you. What an honor. I want these guys to hold on one sec. Oh, can you guys just hold hands? I just feel like you have poured out all your lives long to the body of Christ. And I know you've had many pour back into you through this season. But I just feel like this is prayer school. And that's what we do in prayer school. And I just wanted to pray over you guys for your book and your next level. You know, like it's like, you know, there's layers, you know, and um, you guys, um, I'm just going to pray. Father, thank you. Shinakandu la mandele bishto non gorra babaste kirieto korra babaste havianondo a la vita calavieriato rashe he 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 Father, we thank you, Lord, for Charlie and Jill, Lord, and bringing them to us this weekend. And we just reach out in the spirit by faith, and we uh, set ourselves in agreement, Lord, for what you have written down for them in this next season of their life, Lord. The next level of healing, the next level of revelation, the next level of comfort, the comfort and the, commun and the communion of the Holy Spirit, that they already know you, Lord, but they'll know you like they've never known you, Lord. Sapashte siato shtekende, and for their book, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that the multitudes, that as they pick up that book, even as they just pick it up, Lord, that you, um, you're going to do the work. Their love's going through that book, and Lord, even as they pick it up, that the, the knots will begin to be untied, that the answers will come, that revelation and healing, Lord, that they will go on and be stronger than before, better than if it never happened, stronger than before. Thank you, Lord. Answers, answers in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you guys. Okay, everybody, hello. We're already sort of started prayer school. And um, I am going to encourage, is there anyone who's never been to prayer school? Awesome. Oh, I would encourage you, um, this might be different than any prayer meeting you've ever been to, but I would just encourage you to stay because um, this is where um, the Lord gave me two words. Activation and revelation. So you guys can have a seat if you want, and we'll we'll probably stand back up in a little bit. <clears throat> Jill and Charlie beat me to it. I usually have everybody. Like you said, sometimes you just gotta stand up and. Um, but the goal of prayer school is um, to get to to activate you, and many of you are already activated, but to activate you. And then to have us, 
it's not when I say you, I mean all of us, because it's for me, the, <laughs> for me too, and Kevin, you know, is to get activated and to begin to pray by revelation, okay? Because it's so much funner when we're play, praying from a place of revelation, because that's where you're, uh, you're far above and you have the bird's eye view. And I'm sure that's happened to all of us at different times in our life. Even when you got born again, that's a perfect example. You probably saw Christians all your life and you're like, what's that? Or, or maybe you grew up in a family where you heard about Jesus. Then all of a sudden one day it became Jesus and me. Jesus is my savior. That's like revelation. And for those of you that are filled with the Holy Spirit, you might have heard about praying in tongues or this or that, you know, um, people getting slain in the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit, and then all of a sudden it happens to you. And then that's like revelation. So that's going from your head to your heart or just to like, it's like, like Jesus asked the disciples, who do, who do men say that I am? And some of them said, well, you know, John the Baptist or Elijah, you know. No, he said, who do you say that I am? And he said, um, well, Peter said, thou art the Christ. Now, I'm, a lot of times I repeat stuff because some of you haven't been to prayer school before, and it's really simple. So I don't mind repeating stuff because you, when you hear it more, then you remember it. And I give stories. I like to tell stories because if you have a picture, a picture speaks a thousand words, and you can take that home with you. So Peter said to Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus was like, Blessed are you, Peter, because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. So he didn't figure that out on his own. But he said, my Father, which is in heaven. Okay, so that's like revelation. So Peter didn't, you know, he wasn't saying like maybe you're John the Baptist or Elijah. But he said, thou art the Christ. So he just had that revelation. And obviously it wasn't like because Peter was so neat, because later he had to get rebuked because he said the wrong thing, you know. And, you know, Jesus had to tell him to get behind him because he wasn't saying the right thing. So, but at that particular moment, he was speaking by revelation. And that is really the goal is for us to live in that revelation realm because that's really where we're protected. But the other part of it is activation. So there's revelation, but we also, Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. So Jesus was very productive, you know, Think about how productive God is and God's people. Like, they, in the Old Testament, they built temples. I mean, down to, like, it says they built the temple and they finished it. So they weren't just busy building, but they also finished it. So we, so I, that's really what's on my heart, too, is that, imp so, okay, Kevin and I did another book. And um, can you pull this up for me? Just pull up my Kindle. It's, it should be right there. Just turn it on. And we don't have a hard copy, but I have a picture on the Kindle. So our new book is called, um, this is Lauren. Okay. Okay. And then, so I just want to see the cover. How do I get to the cover? Um, go to my live. Oh, there it is right there. Okay. Oops. So the book is called, okay, can you hold it up? Kind of just walk, because since we don't have a hard copy, just, you don't have to go through the aisles, but just along the front. It's almost the size of a real book, right? So it's called, <clears throat> Kevin, one day he goes, we need to write another book on prayer, okay? Because prayer is like this unstoppable thing in our lives where we just, it seems like we never get to the end of it. And we just have such a passion to share it with everybody else. So what the cover is, it's a picture of a guy getting ready to um, run. Because that's what the Lord said. It's getting started. Okay. And then, so that's the name of it. It's effective prayer because we love that scripture. It says the prayers of a righteous man avail much and are, are effective. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so... That's why we put it there. And getting started is because some we get people come to us at all different stages. So our heart is just, some people don't know where to start. So we wrote this book so you know where to start and then keep started. 
So we want you to get started and keep started, okay? <clears throat> and we want you to be able to pray every day. And um, a lot of, who works, you know? Who has kids, you know, whatever. Who has to go to the grocery store? So uh, we have all these things we need to do, but we want to be able to do it all. And that's what we believe and we know is that you can do it all. <clears throat> you can get started in prayer and keep praying. And um, there's a lot of books on this topic of um, different types of prayer. Like Brother Hagen, of course, has some great ones. But we just wanted something simple for the people who come to our meetings to know how to engage with, like, how do I pray for somebody who needs healing? How do I pray for my friend that wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You know, how do I pray for where I'm going to live? You know, all these different prayers. We have about 13 or 14 different prayers in there. That would be great, Lauren. And so it's, it's just a real simple book, but it gives you... Um, some scriptures for different types of prayer, okay? Because, of course, you know, Kevin and I really believe in praying in the Spirit because that's one of the quickest ways to get up in the Spirit and get into that revelation realm. It's like a jet taking off, you know? It's like you break, you break free from this um, natural realm. And um, so anyhow, that's our book, and it just came out, and so we're so thankful, and we're thankful for everyone that helped us with it. Very simple, but it's very, it's not complicated to pray, but it's going to help you. Like, if you have a scripture to stand on, you know, for salvation or healing, or somebody needs deliverance from a devil, you know, or something, it's just nice to have a few guidelines, and then you're going to have faith, you know, because when you're in faith, then you're going to be able to pray from a place of... Um, believing. You're not going to be double-minded. And um, so, praise the Lord. Does that make sense? Just a simple book. So hopefully next time, next um, conference, we'll have it back there on the table for y'all. And um, so, we well, live in Louisiana. Yeah, so we learned how to say y'all. And I like it because it say it's like you know it's like one word and it includes everybody. Nobody ever felt nobody ever feels left out, you know, <laughs> right, Sydney? Y'all. So um, yeah, but as far as being a person of prayer, and um, really where prayer starts is with your first love. That's really the starting point. You know, if you think about your first love, and you just carve away all the things that your mind tries to s set on, and you think about beautiful Jesus, your Savior, how he came to you, how he rescued you, and made you able to get it to where you could say yes to him. I mean, that's a miracle in itself. So that's a great place to start in prayer, is thinking about how wonderful he is, how you first came to know him, how even it, that he died for you on your worst day, not your best day. You know, when you were still powerless is when he came to you. So you have that heart of gratitude. And that, it, you know, it says in the word that to him who has shall more be given, and to him who doesn't, even that which he has will be taken away. What Basically what that means in today's terminology is if you're not thankful, you're going to end up getting less thankful. But if you're thankful, it's like a flow. You know, you just start to thank and thank and thank and thank. You know, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for filling me with the Holy Spirit. Thank you for moving in my family's life, you know. Thank you for the angels that are listening to um, the Word of God that comes out of my mouth and that they're helping me. The angels are so present. There's so many angels in this room. There's so much light in this room. And that's why I really encourage everybody, why you want to stay in prayer school is because you can pray at home, and that's, we encourage you to pray, at, you know, pray and just make it a lifestyle. But when we're in a meeting like this, we are all strengthening each other. You know, it's like our faith is, it, there's like each one of us has a supply of the Spirit. So we're all being uh, strengthened in this atmosphere. And then when we do pray... It's um, certain things that God wants to take care of. And we found that in every prayer school, that there's always something he wants to take care of. And we just hook up with him 
And then there's, you know how that goes. You pray, and then all of a sudden you get that release, and you might not know what exactly was taken care of, but something was taken care of, you know. And then you're just, you're just thankful that you got to participate with him in that. And so um, is there, like, how many in here, I'm just curious, because this is our first time in this city, who in here has, knows, has ever heard about praying in the Spirit? A few of you, okay, quite a few of you heard, and you under, have you heard about praying in tongues? No? Okay, a few of you. It's, who's never heard about praying in other tongues or being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Is there anyone in here that's never heard about um, being filled with the Spirit or praying in other tongues? Is there anyone in here who's, um, okay, so it sounds like everybody's all heard about it. Is there who has prayed in the Spirit and in other tongues before? Oh, quite a few of you. Who in here has never prayed in tongues or prayed in the Spirit? Okay, just a couple. Okay, all righty, because we'll, um, maybe before the end of the service, if you want to, um, actually, you can get filled right there in your seat. A lot, it's pretty easy. And, um, because being filled with the Spirit is as easy as getting born again. Because just like Jesus has already come, the Holy Spirit's already come. So you can just tell him yes. And then he's going to give you new sounds. And that's a that's the prayer language. And it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> your mind is never going to really totally get it. Other than if you reprogram your mind by, with the scriptures to know that, that God chose this for us. Because he knew if he could get a hold of our tongue... He could really help us a lot <laughs> because life and death is in the power of a tongue, you know. And like a cruise ship, a big old cruise ship or a battleship, as big as it is, it has a rudder that's way smaller than that ship. But it's like whichever direction the rudder goes is that's how the ship's going to go. And that's how it is with our tongue. Whichever way our tongue goes, um, that's the way our life's going to go. So we can pray in English and with our understanding, but it's just such a blessing to be able to have the Holy Spirit pray through us because you know when you're praying in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I mean the third person of the Trinity is praying through you. So you know you're going to be hitting the mark that's in God's heart. You're going to be like aligning up, you know, and um, it's just so restorative. So we're going to, um, we, we kind of do, uh, there's like little ebbs and flows. We do, we practice here because um, the reason that we pray, like I'm not just going to do all the talking and praying today. This is like a group activity because like Paul said, he talked about offerings. He wanted people to give offerings, not for himself, because he wanted, um, he wanted like fruit to their account. That's why he said that. And that's the same with prayer. It's like the reason why we want you to pray and we're so excited for what God's doing already in your prayer lives is because we want fruit to your account. You know, it's like we want like that whole, um, I always tell the story about Mount Rainier, but I have seen, the, I come from Seattle, I grew up there and they, we have this beautiful mountain, Mount Rainier. There are some of the coolest pictures where it's like Mount Rainier has its own weather. And it's almost like that's how, I, that's how I see people when we're praying in the Spirit. It's like you can create your own weather. So like if, if there's like a storm around your head, you know, and like just all this like white noise or not necessarily, maybe probably worse than white noise, and all of a sudden you're just like, wait a minute. All of a sudden it starts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It just turns. It just turns. Because we're called to live like God. We're created in His image. And He spoke and then He saw. We're not supposed to see and then speak. So we're going to be happiest when we're functioning the way we're created to function. So we're going to, I want you to think about this right now. We're not, we're not in a hurry. We're not getting into works. In fact, it says that you can labor to enter the rest. And you, you'll find, I have this one friend that I pray with on a regular basis. And um, 
usually we just pray just because we've made that commitment. So we'll say, you know, it hasn't been a while, so let's pray. So we get together on the phone and we pray. And it's not because anything's wrong. We just have this commitment that we're going to pray. So this is what happens, I'd say, almost every time I pray with her, is I'm having a great day, she's having a great day, but we just pray until the Spirit lets go of us, you know, or until we, you know, come, come into it. We just kind of know when it's done. And every time we're, we get in this place and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's so glorious. But it's like not until, you know, it's kind of like when you take off down the runway and um, like we fly quite a bit, you know, with what we do. And even working, we used to fly a lot. And, um, you know, you go down the runway, all of a sudden that plane, it breaks free from gravity and it's up. It could be a cloudy day and next thing you know, you're up and it's sunny up there, you know. And you're like, wow, sunny day, every day up here. You know, and that's how it is in prayer. Every day it's a sunny day. And so we have so much provision for us. You know, like Kevin's been teaching this weekend that what you don't know is going to limit you. Like if we don't know our covenant, we are totally limited. But when we know our covenant, watch out. I mean, we're going to like be in calling the shots. When we know what that covenant that's cut in the blood of Jesus is so complete so um, the best thing I can do for all of you right now is let you pray with me, okay? So let's just, we've already stood, but let's stand one more time. And this isn't prison. Nobody has to stay, but you, I'm encouraging you, and I'm, you're welcome to stay, and I would love for you to stay because I know how much praying is going to help you. And you, it's like you're sowing seeds today for tomorrow, okay? Like, I know I have friends that, you know, we've prayed with over the years, and sometimes we just look at each other, and we're just like, I wonder if today what's going on is what a f result of what we prayed yesterday, you know? I mean, a lot of it's just God's mercy, but I, he has just given us this gift, and so it's, it's like we are being a good steward of that gift of the Holy Spirit. So um, we're just going to pray, and we're praying together. So you can pray loud, but don't pray too loud to where you're louder than everybody else, because then that becomes a distraction to the people near you. And then if you're just new to praying in the Spirit, this is a good time maybe if you're more of a quiet prayer and you want to like let a little bit more out. This is a nice safe place to let a little more out, you know? Okay? So I'm just going to pray a general prayer over us, and then we'll pray. we're just going to pray in the Spirit or in other tongues a little bit. So, Father, I just cover this room in the blood of Jesus, the walls, ceilings, the floors, pulpits, the pews, the altar. Father, we um, thank you for your angels around us. We break all witchcraft, sorcery, divination, cannot operate in here. Lord, we thank you that your word and your spirit have free course. We thank you for your joy, Lord. We thank you for your covenant cut in the blood of Jesus. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord over this prayer meeting. And we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. And um, Holy Spirit, we give you permission to pray out what you need prayed out through us today. At this time, in this place, in this nation, and in this state. And in this, on this piece of property here. So we yield to you now and we pray. Oto ko rababash du kuna tenikiste, o rabavave, o rabavave, o rabavave, bushave, 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 kifase, kufase, kufase kondo, ramash tame kiamosto, brekeshe, brekeshe, brokosto, brandeshte, branika, brotoko, rabaste, kalevita, kalavita, 
Kalavita, Kalavonda Gorra Mangande, Kalavonda Gorra Mangande, Kalavorra Mangare Gendiando, Orambari Abushtabari Atokurro, Ave la Vila Via Tokurra Babaste, Ilavianondo Gorra Mamaste. And if you're watching online too, just join with us. Shabor rababa sikia bokuso kuste. Sokor rababa shikia mokor ramashte. Shavor rababa vaste keriesto. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and makes tremendous power available. Shamata dias tokor rababaste. Ondoriate and righteous doesn't mean you're perfect, it means you're right because of what Jesus did for you. He made you right. Hale veke, lave loto, lavina teshinite, shopokorababashe, orababase. Thank you, Lord. Now, I just want to let you all know, too, that um, the Lord reminded me something from this morning in worship is that in this atmosphere, there's so many things that can be taken care of super quickly. And so if there's, um, you know, like um, Charlie and Jill shared their hearts, and um, it just feels like the Lord's kind of just been ministering um, to us all weekend, that he's, he's just so tender and so loving to us this weekend. Um, it's just really special. So if, if any of you have like some something that you need to put before the Lord, this is a great atmosphere just to let him work. It can be a quick work. It can be, um, the Lord told me once in a um, death situation I went through, it was a death of a, a marriage. And so that's like a person dying, that's like something dying yet while living. It's really kind of bizarre. But um, he said, joy comes in the morning. And now we love that scripture, but then later on, a few years later, he said, um, when I was ministering to someone, he said, joy can also come in the M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, in the morning, in the midst of your morning, if joy comes, it's okay. And don't be surprised if it comes in the midst of your morning. Joy can come in the M, like morning, like good morning, AM, but it can also come in the midst. That's how quick, that's a quick work the Lord can do. In the midst, of, in the middle of your morning, the joy can come. And the joy, when it comes, it doesn't have to make sense. It might be the Holy Spirit laughing. He might be laughing. He might be, it says, God sits in the heavens and laughs. He might be laughing at your enemy. He might be laughing at your enemy. I just felt like to share those little things. And we can just, so just, if there is something while we're praying in the spirit with everybody in this corporate anointing, let him heal you. Let him touch you. Let him make all things new. It's not too much for him. It's not too much for him. Shoboto, is Jamie in here? Or what's that say on her backpack? Can you have her come up here? Shamokurra mama sikiria mokurra mama sekete. Uraviare ishtokurra ba sikiria mokurra mama se. Uje te, uje te, uje te. Kila, kila, kore, kore, kufa, kufa. Kefe, kefe, kusoto, soto, soto. Humbrande shtene, he tene, he te. He tene, he tene, he te. He te la vita la visto. Uda vada vidi vidiato korra babase. Sudo do do shto. The reason I love to have us all pray in tongues is because there's there's stuff that no man can fix but when you're praying in the spirit there might be knots that you don't even know they're there but he can un the lord can untie you could wake up you might have offense you might have bitterness that you've been trying to like sh shake off you could wake up or you could walk away from this prayer meeting and say hey where did that go i don't you know i don't feel it you know, it's gone. You know, it supernatural deliverance is what I'm believing for. And that's what happened to me. Did you find her? There you are. Can you come up here and just share? I, you're so sweet. This is Jamie. And she, we picked her up the other day in Concord. And she had the coolest backpack on. And she had just had it made. But it had this saying on it. And I just love it. Can you share it with everybody? 
I put on it, it says, Jesus can heal what you're hiding. And I just love that because if you're really going through something that like you don't talk to about to anyone and or even people that you don't that you trust, obviously if you're really, really going through something and you're scared or embarrassed, God still knows that you're going through it. And Jesus can heal you from that. And I just love that saying. And like I just wanted to kind of let people realize that. So that's why I put on my backpack. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Jeez, God can heal what you're hiding, right? Jesus. Can heal. So I, I, just on that line, if there is something you're hiding, I would just say in this atmosphere, nobody has to know, is there something about when you, it says confess your faults one to another and pray that you may, may be healed. So if there's something, I would just, you can just say it under your breath to the Lord, because this is like, He's just, he's just kind of hitting these things in here. So if this is a different flow, but we're just going to go with it. So if there's something you're, you're hiding that you, feel that's, you just feel like you can't even tell anybody, you don't even want to say it. If you just say it in this atmosphere, just get it out. It's kind of like if you have a splinter. You just want to get it out. There's something about confessing it out. Just like it, through confession is how we get born again with our mouth. There's something about confessing something out. And so, and then maybe someday you could ask the Lord, maybe there's somebody I could share with, you know, and have that. So um, we'll just all have our, be praying in the spirit. And as we're praying in the spirit with, you know, our eyes closed, it's not, it's just between you and the Lord, but I would encourage you. That's part of becoming healthy and free. And the Lord's doing that for us today. Shalakila hutosh nehende idavare kuste. Thank you, Lord. I just pray, Lord, I'm just going to set myself in agreement, Lord, if, with that word that Jamie gave about the, you, you can see what we're hiding. <sighs> Thank, and Lord, I just give you permission. You guys can pray this too, Lord. We just give you permission. If there's anything that we're hiding that we don't know we're hiding, that you would show us. We just want to be clean and free and flow with you, Lord, and finish our courses with joy. Now I'm going to tell you, you guys can sit back down. Because I feel like I'm supposed, I was going to tell you the story, and now I know I'm going to tell you the story. It's a testimony, and some of you have heard it, but um, have, is there anyone in here who's ever heard of Bobby Jean Merck? Okay, she's like an awesome woman of God. Well, she recently, just like in the last week or two, went home to be with the Lord. And so I'm sure she's just having a wonderful time up there. But this is a, an example of what happened to me, of something that I was, I didn't really know I was hiding. Okay, so I go into the service, and um, when I went through the divorce, I felt like a ping pong ball out on the ocean. This is before I met Kevin. We could call it BK, before Kevin. So, <laughs> I don't know, I just thought of that. So, it's before Kevin, I don't want to, you know, he wasn't part of this at all. He didn't even know me. But Brian McKellum, did you ever meet Brian McKellum? He was maybe there after you guys, but he became the dean of students, and he was um, Brother Hagen's pilot, and he used to fly the SR-71, okay? And he left it. He was going to be, like, part of the space program. He left it to go in the ministry, but because he was obedient and he went into the ministry, when Kevin went back to Rama to talk to him um, after he'd gotten on with Southwest, he was sharing, they were sharing airplane stories and all this, you know, and, you know, missions and stuff. And then Kevin said, you know, I really felt like I was going to meet my wife here. And Brian's like, I guess Brian's like a military guy, so he wasn't like real emotional. He goes, I don't know what to tell you. And then right after he said that, the Lord came in the room and filled the room and he began to just get weepy and he said, the Lord told me to tell you that the woman you're supposed to marry is about to enter another relationship and it's going to take her four years to get back on track. That was exactly what was happening. I was in Washington State. This was in Oklahoma. Kevin lived in Phoenix. I, you know, we didn't know each other, never met each other. And, the, and so then at the end of those four years, the Lord told Kevin, your wife's in Seattle. And so after I was free and clear of that, because I entered, I got married to some, you know, in my limited knowledge. And what I, my takeaway from that was marrying the wrong person is the Lord told me to tell people the plan's not too grand. So whatever he's promised you, don't let go of that. He's not asking you to bring it to pass. He's just asking you to stay in agreement with him. You know, just believe him that, yeah, okay, Lord, if I can have a godly marriage, I believe you. He's not asking you to bring it to pass. So I settled, you know, and it didn't work out. The guy went back 
into the world. And the Lord caused me, he had me judge myself, though. That was interesting. He said, you know, you owe no man anything but to love. And so once I was out of that and on the other side, um, the Lord released, told Kevin to come find me, and he did. And then, so it was a quick work. But before I met Kevin and the divorce happened, I just, I never thought that would happen to me. And I was like, I really felt like a, so vulnerable, like a ping pong ball out on the ocean. And I um, had some pastors in my life, and I know they were praying for me, but I, mm-hmm. I kind of got a little bit, uh, I drank a little bit. Like I had come out of that, you know, when I got born again, I got set free from everything. I mean, my friends were like, what happened to you? You know, no drugs, no alcohol, C- cigarettes took a little while, but they went too. And um, so, but then when I went through that rough spot, I was going out with a friend that was also going through a rough spot. And, you know, we kind of weren't a very good influence on each other. So one night I just told the Lord, cause I could tell she was, she was, she wasn't trimming her back at all. And then, so I'm like, I, this, I got to bail out of this situation now because this is not a good, healthy situation. And I knew my pastors were praying for me, but <sighs> I'm trying to do the nutshell version. So I told the Lord that night, I am, I know you're going to restore me. I'm not going down this road. I made a covenant with him. And so that was the end of it. You know, I stopped hanging out with her and I was just being with the church and stuff. And um, so one day I went to church, and there was a guest speaker. It was Bobby Jean. And I'm sitting in the service, just like in the center, and um, she's calling out these healings, you know, people are getting healed. And then all of a sudden she goes, this word is for someone, and she was like a southern belle, dresses, you know, she had the accent. She's from Topeka, Kansas. And um, she said, this word is for someone, they're either struggling with drugs and alcohol, or they're struggling in their mind. And I mean, the fire of God hit me. It was like in my belly, like a fire. And I'm like, I didn't care. Who knew? I'm going to that altar. That word was for me. I didn't care. I'm like, I'm not doing it, but it's unresolved in my mind. So I went forward, and she, I stood in front of her. She laid hands on me. And um, before she said what I, it, it kind of all happened at once, but I saw myself, you know, the scripture says, he's delivered free, me from the murky mire and he set my feet on the rock. That's like what happened in, all in a moment because I, my whole Christian life, I'd wanted to serve the Lord full on, but because I was unresolved in my mind about not drugs, but alcohol, because everybody like, they think, you know, it, it, it's like, it's so accepted, you know, just a glass of wine. Plus I grew up with it, but so I'm like, she laid hands on me, put her hands on my head. She goes, mind control, I break your power. Yeah, and I mean, I hit the ground like a sack of potatoes. And I was just laying there, just kind of crying. I was like, <gasps> she comes over to me, she goes, you foul devil, you come out of her in the name of Jesus. And something just left me, and I just started laughing. But I'm telling you what, I walked away from that service. I felt like I had been born again, again. And they say the fruit of deliverance is in deliverance. I mean, I had no desire. I mean, I was so free. It was like, and never, it wasn't, so the point is, back to J- Jamie's backpack, I didn't know I needed deliverance. I had, I didn't even know if, I, I don't even know if I knew about deliverance. I didn't like hang out, with, you know, I know about deliverance now, but back then I didn't. And so I got delivered from something I didn't even know I needed delivered from, but this is the thing, is the Lord heard the cry of my heart was to serve him full on. So that's so many of us, we just want to serve the Lord full on you know, and he caused me to be in the right place at the right time where that word could come and I could get set free. And the cool thing was, is then when I did meet Kevin, he had that consecration. The Lord had told him when he was 10, don't drink, don't smoke, and I have somebody for you. So he already is on that page. So then when I met him, I was on that page. But it's it's pretty serious. I'm not... He's in um, Luke twelve twenty nine. It talks about talks about how the Lord's going to clothe us, not to worry. But it says this is really we love this. We Kevin and I learned this um, a few years, well quite a while back. But in there, that word it says neither be of a doubtful mind. A doubtful mind. It says when you translate that out, 
in um, Luke 12, 29, is to meteorize. It's like witchcraft. It's like it opens you wide up. So we're talking about not being of a doubtful mind, not worrying, but living in the revelation realm. I am like prophesying to you. The Lord's called us to live in the revelation realm, far above, far above in the revelation realm, not meteorizing, not being of a doubtful mind. It says, how long will you halt between two opinions? If God's God, serve him. If Baal's God, serve Baal. That's what God's saying to the body of Christ. Rise up. If God's God, serve him. Choose ye this day. This is not a hard word I am saying to you right now. This is life and death. Life and death. Life and death. Choose ye this day. Be on the right side. Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith? Don't take this word personally right now. The Lord's speaking this way because it's either there's somebody in this room or somebody who's going to watch. If it's not you, don't worry about it. But sometimes he has to say things because he needs to confirm it. He might say something you've heard a hundred times, but that's because he wants to say it, and then he wants to be able to confirm it. He confirms his word with signs and wonders. And the angels hearken to the voice. They hearken, they listen to his voice. So they come down and they obey him. So he's warning us not to live in the mental realm. We have a mind, but our mind is supposed to obey the word of God. Just like you have a computer, and if it has bad stuff on it, y'all know what I mean, uh, you got to get rid of that and reprogram it and put your Bible soft on there. <laughs> Sometimes computers need deliverance too, <laughs> I've found. So, um, and it's not usually our fault. It's just, it's just the way it is. So does that make sense? He's really for our own good, because that's where we're going to have fun, is in the revelation realm. And that's where you can get it done. And you save so much time, you know. Yeah, so he does not, obviously, I can gather from what he's saying to us here today, he doesn't want us to meteorize or halt between two opinions. It's for our own good, because that was what got me in trouble. I had, so the point is, from my story, and I'm honoring Bobby Jean, since she has just recently been promoted to glory, is I, my 10 years as a Christian, I had never resolved alcohol. Now, for me, I'm not telling, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just telling this is my testimony that my heart was to serve God full on, and that was something that obviously I didn't know, I would have, if, if someone would have said, you know, I know you want to, if I, you know, serve God full on, what do you think you need to do for that to happen? I probably would have said, go to Bible school, you know, or something like that. I had no idea. It, in order for me to serve him full on, meant that was, I'm going to have to get rid of that wa wavering in my mind about alcohol. I had no idea. It was not on my radar. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. It's like I had decided, you know, I'm not going to drink anymore, but it wasn't, I didn't, it was just something I'd done in my own strength. And he wanted to, you know, they talk about the 12 steps. Well, there's a 13th step, and that's deliverance. <laughs> yeah, so I'm thankful for the 13th step, you know. That's deliverance, where it's like, I, it's like it was never a part of me. So the Lord's really speaking to us. That's what got me in trouble, is I was unresolved. And just to give God the glory, is um, she didn't know this, that it, at, you know, that was, I was 28. I got born again at 18, got delivered at 28. And um, after, before I, I was going to go, after I, the, I, the devil left and I was laughing, I was kind of stuck to the floor. But then when I felt released, I was like, I think I can get up now. I'm going to, you know, see myself back to my chair. You know, she goes, wait a minute. She goes, God's not done with you. She walks over to me. She says, God wants you to go back in a newness and a freshness to where you were 10 years ago, and he's going to restore to you all the years the locusts have eaten. She had no idea that 10 years ago is when I got born again. So, you know, praise the Lord, taking 10 years off your life. <clears throat> she goes, she goes, 
Yeah, she's got to take 10 years off your life. She goes, she goes, you know what? She goes, you're going to rejoice at this word. Now I'm rejoicing at it, you know, <laughs> 10 years off my life, praise the Lord. So in a good way, you know, not shortened, but, you know, getting my youth back. So praise the Lord. But the Lord's really speaking to us that we can't, it's for our own good that we're not. So if, so let's say you're saying, well, Kathy, I have all these questions about this or that. That's fine. Just be honest with the Lord and say, Lord, give me the answer. Give me the revelation. And that's what I say too. Like even like, um, like with you guys, I would demand revelation over your situation. Answers. I mean like supernatural revelation. I would demand that. Not from the Lord, but just make, that's my inheritance, you know, that you're going to have so many answers, so much revelation, so many people are going to get, you know, it's going to be sevenfold recompense. So your son's going to be like, yeah, go mom, go dad, you know, help those people, pull them out, you know, just the, you, just the tools to get it done. You know what I mean? Answers. Because when you get that revelation, like, um, so that's a, like, so that's a good example of revelation too. So I didn't know I needed delivered or about deliverance. But then now, one day I didn't, the next day I did. That's revelation. And um, I guess it's kind of story time. So, but the spirit, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And um, I knew I reached a point where I was going to have to um, divorce the person I was married to because he was in another relationship and didn't plan on leaving it. And, um, but it was really more about him and his relationship with the Lord. But the Lord had me staying in there to a certain point because there's like a space of repentance. And so one day I came home and he told me, he goes, because I'd been praying and I was going to all these, uh, this prayer meeting for people that were believing for their spouse to come back to the Lord. And I said, I came home from work one day and he goes, the Lord spoke to me today. And I was like, oh, you know, praise the Lord. The prayers are working now. <laughs> And I go, really, what did he say? He goes, well, the Lord told me if I'm not going to serve him to let his lamb go. Yeah. So see how it was about him and the Lord. And I was the lamb. And now, at hindsight, it's a great word, and I'm so glad the Lord intervened. But at the time, the way he said it, I knew, okay, he's not going to serve the Lord, which means he's letting me go, which means I'm being abandoned, is how I took it. So I had, that's what, why I felt like a ping pong ball out on the ocean. You know, you just kind of feel abandoned. But the Lord, like, I'm not abandoned now. I'm over it. And that was another, I'm just giving you all these words I got because it talks about when you get a word of the Lord, it's revelation. And it's like all of a sudden, it's like everything's okay. So we're driving and I was taking care of some of the business, dealing, you know, having to get a divorce and all that stuff. And it was, I had to actually go see this person. Um, you know, he was a hairdresser too. And so we had to go down to Seattle. And my friend was with me. And I had to face him. I just didn't want to, you know, it's just weird. It was a weird situation. So on the way back from Seattle, my friend, her name was Anne. And she was, would call me Catherine. And she's a very black and white personality. She was, Catherine? The Lord just told me to tell you that the good that he has for you is so good, you won't remember the bad. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, oh, that's such a nice, thanks, Anne. You know, great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's exactly what happened. I couldn't even try to be sad over it, you know, anymore. And at the time, it just seemed like so far-fetched. But it happened, just like she said. And she's not the type of person that just offered words, you know. She just, but she was like, obviously, the Lord was telling her to say that. And um, so the other word, so we're talking about revelation, okay. So I knew I had to divorce him because, you know, I had to, I just, I had gotten the divorce kit and I was trying to do all this stuff. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. You know what I mean? It was like, how, how do you divorce somebody, you know? But it's like, for him, basically, it was finances. He didn't want to, he wouldn't want to fork out 500 bucks or whatever, you know? And, you know, he's just on with his life. It's like he didn't have time to get divorced. And so I was going to have to do it, even though I felt like, you know, I felt like he should do it since it was his idea to get married. You know, he proposed to me. I'm like, you know, then you should divorce me. But anyhow, I'm in the service, and... It was a church I went to, which was on fire, and um, but I the pastors had taken me in, so I lived with um, Pastor Joe and Linda, and they had taken me in and their kids, 
And so we were all a tight family in a sense, because I, they kind of like really, I felt like that was my family. And, um, but they had a church and it was on fire. So Linda's preaching, uh, it was like, you know, like a Wednesday service or something. And all of a sudden she stopped. She goes, Miss Kathy, and, um, this is the day to get out. Don't ever look back. And it hit me. And, um, it was such a strong anointing, and you know how it is if you know people. You, you can't, it's, but when it's really, then it doesn't matter who they are. It goes in, and so I knew. That was my word, and there was a bunch of stuff about how he was going to restore me, which pretty much described Kevin to a T, and then before that, it was about the ministry and how he's going to use me, and um, so on and so forth. But that word, it's the day to... It's the day to get out. Don't ever look back. And I would, I'll care, carry you as a shepherd would carry a lamb all the days of your life. I'll nourish you. <sighs> the Lord's so good. He so said, I'll, I'll carry you all the days of the lamb, all the days of your life, and I'll nourish you. And um, just like, it's so powerful. But my point is, is that, word of the Lord off the pulpit under the anointing brought revelation to me. So I never looked back from there. I had all the kits. I kept trying to get out of the boat. Every service would kind of encourage me, okay, I'm going to go home and do it, you know, and do it and, you know, divorce this person. And, you know, I was doing it in love because really I had gone through all these steps of obedience to burn out the rejection. And it it came to the place where if I didn't divorce him, I was condoning what he was doing. So I had to. And so, but once I got that prophetic word, there was such an anointing with it. So that's, some, sometimes you guys might be in a situation where there's things you know you need to do, but if you don't have that revelation on it yet, just wait for the revelation. You know, though the vision tarry, wait for it, it says in Habakkuk 2. You know what I mean? Don't be in a hurry. Wait for the revelation. And then there's going to be like an anointing with it. There's going to be victory with it, you know? And if so, but just ask the Lord for help, you know, say, Lord, let me be in the right place at the right time with the right people. And that's why I have you guys pray in tongues. Like some of you, this is your first prayer school, but because I know we, Kevin and I can't do everything that needs to be done in your lives. But if we can help you pray in the spirit, that's just going to accelerate everything. It's going to help untie the knots. It's going to make the crooked places straight. You know, it's going to bring you the answers. It's, and when you hear your own self, it's those vibrations. It's like, you know, your voice is your address in the spirit, you know? So on that note, let's go ahead and we're going to, now we're going to pray in the spirit and we're going to, we're, we're going to like, you're like making a way you're, you're praying and, you know, everything can happen all at once. You can be praying a way into your future. You can be praying for your whole family. You can be praying for your nation, you know? You can be praying for the service tonight. You know, it can all, all, everything all at once. We have that kind of faith. So here we go. Let's stand up. We're going to pray a little bit more. And then we're not going to go too much longer because I think I'm going to need to let you go around. What time are we ending? Five. This means five. Okay. All right. So that means we have like about nine minutes, eight minutes. But we can, uh, you know, one of my favorite scriptures is, can a nation be born in a day? Yes. It's implied, yes. That's how quick. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Things can happen super fast. And so that's why um, we just like to have that kind of faith. Because all of us have stuff going on that's way beyond us, but it's not beyond God. So, Lord, we just thank you in these last eight minutes. We pray. Um, if there's anyone that wants to be filled with the Spirit that hasn't been filled with the Spirit... While we're praying, you can just come up here and stand up front, and we'll pray with you. If you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire, and you would like that, you can come up here, and we will pray with you um, here shortly. So just come up here and stand up here by the front if that's you. So, and the rest of us are going to pray in other tongues. We're going to let the Holy Spirit complete what he has on his heart to pray through us today. Shavene kitava shanondo. We thank you for revelation, Lord. I just know you're wanting to give revelation to everybody. Answers. 
revelation that's greater than their circumstances. Shakur rava sekia soto. Lave se. Lift up your voice. Moho rama sete. Or rabba baseke. Or rabba baseke. Or rabba baseke. Or rabba baseke. Okay, Pastor Mike's going to pray with you and Brittany. Y'all keep praying in the spirit. And we're just going to do a group prayer with our friends here. Okay, let's have them all pray real quick. I'm gonna, okay, okay. Okay, we're just going to pray with our friends here, and it's good for you to... Is there anyone else here? We're just going to do the prayer now for anyone who wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's for everybody. So we're going to all pray a prayer together. You're going to pray after me, and then Pastor Mike and Brittany and Becca and Mia, are they're going to help too, okay? So have you all been born again? Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, so just pray after me, okay? Say, Father... Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for making a way for the Holy Spirit to come to me today. And I ask you to fill me now with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I loose my tongue and I pray in other tongues now. Now just begin to say the sounds that you hear in your spirit in Bokorra Mase Kete, Orra Baba Sikiria Tokorra Base, Horra Via Tekia Tokorra Baba Sikiriato, Orra Baba Base Kita Kate Keke Kia Tokorra Vashe, Horra Vase Kite, thank you, Lord, Hallelujah, Shorra Mama Se, Ustande Stede de Stokorra Vase. This is a beautiful thing. Remember how wonderful it was when you first got filled? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Jill, if you want to help, that'd be great. Yeah, go for it. Shamakuria Bashte Ishtande Kiria Shokur Ravi Sokur Ravase O Raviato 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 O Raviato Korravase Kete Hofitave Hufatave 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 Shave Shave Shava Lavur Ramasakia Makur Ramase Thank you, Lord. Just thank you, Lord, for filling all our brothers and sisters. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for confirming Shamo Namushtamande, miracle signs and wonders. Miracle signs and wonders. Miracle signs and wonders. We pray for the service tonight, Lord, that it hits the mark in your heart. Miracle signs and wonders. Shavete, Shavete, Shavete. Shavalavurra Vavase. Shavalavur Ravavase, Shavalavur Ravavase, Hore Vede Vede Vediato, Hore. You guys want to get filled? Awesome, okay. Shumotamu Shamante, Utamante Kete, these guys, Shabodia Badiash to Kuriash to Kiriasto, Horravava Sikiria Lavokuramiande. Una vande gedian ondo, horrevese, huravayatai, kurrevese kiria socorravase, horravava variate kiriato, horravava variate kiriato, horravava vashe kiria se, horravariate, horravava vase kiria so. Orra vava vaya to koya teki, horra vava vaso, horra vaya te, horra vava vaso, soto soto, soto soto, di shabate, i shabate, 
Is there anybody here that still needs a little assistance? Okay, come over here. Or Pastor Mike, where'd Pastor Mike go? We found somebody who needs a little extra assistance over here. Were you, did you feel like that person you were with is okay? Okay. You want to you get the Spirit too? Holy, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Okay. And so, what? What? You wanted assistance and you wanted to get released more? Okay. All right. Becca's going to pray with you. You just want to get a greater flow, right? Okay. Awesome. Okay. You need help? Oh, yeah. Okay. Just put your hand on your belly. Say, more, Lord. Fire. Fire. Now pray with me. Okay, keep praying, okay? Everybody out there, put, put your hand on your belly. Say, more, Lord. Fresh fire, fresh fire, fresh fire. Borra ma sekiria mo korra baba sekiria so. Orra baba baso korra base. Orra base keria so koto. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Raise your hands. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, you got it, girl. Okay. Okay, we're just hold on. We're almost through, but we want to make sure everybody is got their package before we seal her up here. Shamote moshenekete, oravasekete. Yeah, fresh fire. More Lord, Shukuta ve shete shoto ruvu satiki soto so horavase so revere vireto fire fire hura viana kirieto dosh te kirien te kirieso halaviri. Thank you, Lord. 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 Shukura visate. Shavoda vode kiriate. You just make sure. This couple with Brittany, they just came up to the last minute. You just make sure, make sure they're good. Are you guys good? Okay. Do you want to, we'll pray with you. Let's, let's pray with them right now. You guys got it? Okay. Let's, let's all pray. So go ahead, girlfriend. Just let her flow. It feels good, doesn't it? Fresh fire, fresh fire, fresh fire. Shukura va sekeriete. Usoto so, soto oso. Thank you, Lord. Healing. You know what? It's like the Lord just loves you guys. Yes. It's like, yes. it's like, you know, when a baby starts talking, that's kind of what it's like. So you don't have to feel awkward. Yep. It's like a whole new language that you never even learned yourself that he gave you. But, you know, you might think, if I could just get this straightened out in my life, you know, this or that, or you might have your mind on a certain thing, but if, when you're praying in the Spirit, then the Spirit might say, no, 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 no. If you take care of that, yeah. everything else will ta- be taken care of. So it's like a, just a, like a whole new level. It's going to cause you just to like, pull, like, they call it like, you know, turn the table on your enemies. Yep. So just like, you know, like Brittany was telling you, just, just pray every day a little bit. And if you need help, uh, go, on, go online. We have prayer shows where we pray in the spirit and stuff, okay? And just kind of pray with us on, t- on YouTube, okay? Okay, God bless you. Thank you. you guys, I'm glad you guys came up. You were bold. Okay. Miss Brittany, there might be one more here, right? No? Oh, Pastor Mike already prayed for you. Okay. Okay. All right, let's everybody... Everybody got their package? Good? We're good? Everyone got their package? Okay. We can go back to our seats, and then we're all just going to close out in prayer together. 
Okay, so everyone can go back to their seats. And then we're going to, are you guys coming back tonight? Okay, good. Just praying. And all of you who just got filled today, hi, sweetie. Thanks for coming up. Are you good? You got your package, didn't you? Okay, so all of you who just got filled today with your prayer language, don't stop praying. Okay, so like when you come to the service, you got your package, brother? Hey, you got your, awesome. Thanks for coming up. Okay, trailblazer. Okay, so keep praying in the other tongues, like in the services, or like when Jason and Brittany and Pastor Mike and Kevin and Caesar and the band, um, when they're when they're you know worshiping, we're all worshiping together. That you can even try singing in the spirit. So you can talk in the spirit, pray in the spirit. We can sing. You know, and so you can do that. And um, so just, this is a great atmosphere just to kind of get that flow going, okay? So um, um, we're going to close. So let's stand as we close. And um, we're just going to pray in just a tidbit, because I just know the spirit, I just like to seal it in. There's like a little... Hush that he always brings. Sama shakura she, alavuno korave she. Jikare, it says Jesus went a little further. We're just a little bit over time. We're just going to shiamakore, make sure that his peace is on this meeting. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We just give you the glory for everything you've done today in this meeting. We give you um, the glory. We seal it in in the blood. We say that we're blessed going in and blessed going out. We thank you for fruit that remains. Halavalavite. Okay, and just everyone raise your hands and tell the Lord thank you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for letting us pray with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and... Mm-hmm.